Good evening. I'd like to call to order the virtual study session of the Lakewood City Council, Lakewood, Colorado, on April 18th, 2022 at uh, 7.05 p.m. For those wishing to participate via phone this evening, please dial 720-707-2699. The webinar ID is 836-2082-9099. You'll press pound after entering and then pound once more to join the meeting. If you're wishing to participate in any of the public input opportunities, feel free to raise your hand now. That's easiest by doing number nine. With that, will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Abel? Here. Franks? Here. Jensen? Here. Maya Guerrero? Here. Over. Here. Sharzai. Here. Springsteen. Here. Stewart. Here. Strom. Here. Vincent. Here. You have a quorum. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get this rolling. Our first item number three is a presentation, a continuation of kind of City Hall 101. I'll turn that over to Ms. Hodson. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, as the Mayor just said, this is a continuation of our 101 to uh, give you kind of an insider's perspective on the role of the City Manager's Office. So with that, um, I'll introduce our Deputy City Manager, Ben Goldstein, who will give the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Goldstein. I think you're on mute, sir. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Mayor and City Council, to share a little bit about uh, the amazing work done in the city manager's office. Go ahead and uh, share my screen so you all can see the PowerPoint. All right. So I think first, uh, it's important that we, uh, in order for the public to understand what the department does, I think uh, it's important that we take a few minutes to explain the council manager form of government. As noted by ICMA, the council manager form is the most popular structure of government in the United States among municipalities of 2,500 or more. It is one of several forms of government, uh, but again, the most popular. Under this form, residents elect a governing body, city council, and a chief elected official, in our case, a mayor, uh, to adopt legislation and set policy. The governing body then hires a manager with broad executive authority to carry out those policies and oversee local, the local government's day-to-day -day operations. Born out of the US, uh, US progressive reform movement at the turn of the 20th century, the council manager form was created to combat corruption, unethical and unethical activities within local governments by promoting non-political management that is effective, transparent, responsive and accountable. The council manager form of government recognizes the critical role of elected officials as policymakers who focus on mapping out a collective vision for the community and establishing the policies that govern it. The form also recognizes the need for a highly qualified individual who is devoted exclusively to the delivery of service to residents. Under this form of government, the city manager takes direction from city council as one body and not individual members. As council is aware, the city manager uh, is one of three employees in the city of, for the city council in the city of Lakewood, the other two being the presiding municipal judge and city attorney. 
City Council should feel proud because currently they have a female leading in all three of these areas, which is unique in local government with females representing the chief executive role in fewer than 20% of local governments. The city manager is the chief administrative officer for the city. By charter, the city manager's responsibilities are to supervise the enforcement of laws and ordinances of the city, appoint, promote, suspend, transfer, and remove all administrative employees of the city, advise city council on, financial, on the financial condition of the city, and make recommendations to city council for future city needs. The city man manager reports on finances and administrative activities of the city and exercises supervision and control over all administrative departments, is responsible for the enforcement of all terms and conditions of any contracts or franchise agreements. As you all know, the city manager attends all council meetings and participates in, it in an advisory capacity, informs the public concerning approved plans and activities of the city council and city administration, and performs such other duties as prescribed by the charter, by ordinance, or by city council as a body. In addition, the office is responsible for the general oversight of the city's relationship with the public, works to promote and improve two-way exchange of information among Lakewood residents, elected officials, and employees. The core functions of the city, uh, of the office are broken into three areas, as you can see uh, in the slide, administration, citizen communication, and overall communication. <laughs> the administration functions include the oversight of all operations throughout the city and the strategic management of the various departments work plans. The city manager's office also plays a key role in the coordination and preparation of city council packets along with the city attorney's office and city clerk's office. The city manage, uh, the city's management, uh, this, sorry, the city manager's office also oversees the management of state and federal legislation in coordination with city council. Additionally, this team provides support and oversight of all calendaring, reconciling of uh, procurement cards, processing budget reports, filing, overseeing front desk activities, and the support of the mayor and members of city council. Under the citizens communication function, we have Request Lakewood, which is the city's customer service hub. This tool offers residents and city council members the opportunities to submit requests, questions, and concerns 24 seven. The requests are then routed to the appropriate departments for response, which is usually provided within two business days. The Request Lakewood system is available at lakewood.org slash request Lakewood and through an app which allows residents to include pictures and others, other items. Also under the citizen communication function is support of council ward meetings, which coordinates guest speakers and sends out meeting notices. Additionally, this position coordinates the citizen survey, which was recently conducted. The results of the 2022 survey will be presented to city council in May. I wanted to use this opportunity to dive a little deeper into the numbers um, as was discussed in council's planning session about uh, what type of requests come in through the request Lakewood system. As you can see in the pie chart, the requests are broken in two categories. Snow removal was the number one request with two for the first quarter of 2022, with 296 total requests. 
and 16%. Uh, sorry, that was snow removal on public sidewalks. Snow removal on streets received 157 requests and represents 9%. Graffiti was 140 requests. Reports on shopping carts, 130. General code enforcement, 124. General streets and sidewalks, 81. Council direct response, that's the request you all put in, 78. Uh, can't find my topic, 75. Report a pothole, um, a common one, uh, but 65. And then all other requests, 665, uh, representing 37% on the pie chart. The total number of requests that were received for January 1 through March 31 of 2022 was 1,811, which would put us on pace for nearly 7,500 requests in 2022, uh, which is quite a bit more than we received in 2021 and 2020 with 5,900 and 6,100 respectively. Under the television services area, the city utilizes video as a platform for content that is visually visual and fast paced. Videos produced by the city include spotlights on services and departments. The city used YouTube to create a city of Lakewood channel and embeds those videos throughout the city website and in other city communication channels. The city also uses the cable, uh, also utilizes cable government access channel eight and HD 880 for Comcast subscribers to present the video programming as well as a 24 seven electronic bulletin board. Lakewood eight also airs all city council meetings, as you all know. This team has also worked with the League of Women Voters for many years to produce a biannual candidate forum. And over the last five years, the city has received over two dozen awards for shows it has produced. This includes programs such as Let's Talk with Mark Colbrick. <clears throat> General Communications Public Information. The communications team in the city manager's office runs an integrated communications and outreach program for both external and internal audiences. Central to external, uh, central to the external element is the city's website, which serves as a hub of information. Similarly, the city's intranet website called Inside Lakewood is the central repository for employee communications and services. The city's website, lakewood.org, serves as a home for information about Lakewood and is easy to ac access. It provides 24 seven access to local government services, functioning as an alternative to in-person interaction, improving co community involvement with local and improving community involvement with local government. The primary audience are residents and future residents, licensed businesses and future businesses. The Friday Report, this weekly electronic newsletter is distributed on Friday and covers city council action, city programs and services, as well as information from schools. The newsletter has about a thousand external subscribers who include residents, businesses, and news media. The newsletter is also distributed to city council, boards and commissions, and all Lakewood employees. And I'm sure many of you enjoy it as well. In brief, uh, it is a brief, easy to read format and includes timely information that is important to residents in the city as a whole. The team also produces Looking at Lakewood, it's published four times a year. This printed newsletter is mailed to all residents in the city, making it one city communication channel that residents receive without having to seek it out. 
it has a circulation of over 80,000 addresses. As you all know, each issue features a section known as Council's Corner, which provides a regular opportunity for the mayor and each ward to share their thoughts on matters relevant to the community. Looking at Lakewood is also available on the city's website in a PDF form for ADA access or in a flippable version. This team also manages social media. The city of Lakewood has established several official outlets on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, providing residents and businesses with an easy way to keep track of city news, programs, and events via their social media channels. The main city Facebook page is facebook.com slash lakewoodgov. And the main city Twitter account is at lakewoodcolo, which I think many of you have used to help retweet for us. Lakewood Together is also managed out of this team. Lakewood Together is, a city, is the city's community engagement portal. The site gives residents, business, and community members an opportunity to get more information and share their thoughts on current projects. That can be located at lakewoodtogether.org. Finally, internal communications. Though this is not an area that you all see a lot, it is tremendously important to the organization. The team helps support a robust internal communications program, including the production of over 50 all-employee newsletters and the management and oversight of the city's intranet. The city also has a print shop. This is the last area that we'll be highlighting of the city manager's office this evening. The print shop houses is housed in the city manager's office communication department and has two employees. The city of Lakewood print shop produces on average 100,000 color copies per month and 35,000 black and white copies and other prints. 90% of all city print jobs are printed in the print shop, including but not limited to large banners up to five feet by 10 feet on the large format printer, numerous brochures, booklets, pre-addressed postcards, envelopes, and business cards, including the business cards you all received. The print shop also has several pieces of equipment to cut, fold, bind, and finish printed materials. Thank you for taking a few minutes this evening to learn about the city manager's office. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and feel free to let me know, or Kathy, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Um, Council, do you have any questions? We have a, there we go. Ms. Sharazai, please. Yeah, thanks, Ben. This was helpful to understand. I, I just have a random question. How many people are in our communications department? Yeah, uh, we have uh, five uh, full-time employees in the communications department. All right, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Maya Guerrero? Yeah, I think it's um, really interesting that our requests are going up. Do you all interpret that as like negative or positive? Because I think to me, it's really easy to argue that having more requests might also mean that we have more people engaged or that it's easier, like more people understand how to submit requests, which to me would be a positive thing. But I wasn't sure if you all had sort of like thoughts on that as staff. Yeah. I I don't think we have a negative impression um, from requests going up. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Um, we want residents reaching out. Um, if they have concerns about snow removal of residential sidewalks, they should let us know and we're happy to help them assist with that or, or any, any other uh, concern they have. So I, I don't see it as a bad thing. I think it's just a data point. Um, I think it more, show, more so shows um, the effort um, that's taking place throughout the organization because though 
those requests come into the city manager's office, they also are handled by every department in the city. Um, so a, a concern might come in um, related to potholes um, through the request liquid system, but really it's public works who's who's doing that work and fixing the pothole and, and doing that communication out to residents. Um, although Dan Stoudemire does do a lot of communication with residents, as I think you all know. All right, anybody else? Okay, so we'll go to public uh, public input. And I see, Pastor Hensley, your hand is up, and I'm not sure if you want to jump on this one or if you're looking to go to the next one on housing. So while we bring you over, go ahead. The next one on housing for me is- uh, All right, yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought, thank you. Oh, yep. yep. Okay, before I go to Ms. Draper again, this is comment for the presentation we just heard. It's three minutes, and when you get to 30 seconds, you'll hear a, when your time is up, you'll hear that again. So, Ms. Draper, do you wish to comment on this most recent presentation? I guess I'd like to comment on Chapter 14.27. Okay, we'll bring you back over um, when we get to that portion of the meeting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Which seeing no more hands, that means we're gonna go right over to that next portion of the meeting. That's item four, discussion Lakewood Municipal Code, chapter 14.27, residential growth limitations. And as a little bit of background, this was uh, brought forward when we were talking about allocations. And there were some questions uh, mainly related to the affordable pool and that was again reaffirmed at the at the planning session and so we're here because the affordable pool is set to expire and and i know that many want to engage on that so miss hodson i'll turn it over to you um yes really thank you um this topic is really for you to talk about whatever kind of uh comments you had about 1427 but to help kind of frame this up. Our planning director, Travis Parker, is here, and I believe he has just a couple of slides to get um, so so that everyone has a chance to kind of start from the same place. So Travis, if we could bring Travis to the screen, right. I believe he has a few slides to share, and then it's really it's really your discussion, uh, Mayor and City Council, and thank you. Great, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Parker. Good evening. I apologize. I'm having some technical difficulties pulling up my slides here. If you grant me a minute or two. Yes, sir. While, while you're doing that, I will note that there were three comments on Lakewood Speaks in regard to this as well. Thank you for the time. Okay. I apologize. I'm having a hard time opening this today. Perhaps I can just talk through it and we can come back to the slides if and when they are able to open. Um, if I remember correctly, <laughs> I'll go through the slides from memory. Um, this was the 1427 was first adopted in 2019 by a vote of the people. Um, the intentions of the ordinance included uh, development of blighted areas, protected, protection of open space areas, um, the prevention of crime um, and protection or, or uh, protection of the resources of the community. Basically, the ordinance does two primary things. Uh, first, it requires allocations for new residential units in the city, uh, for virtually all new residential units in the city with some exemptions. Um, and that is done by the council every January, creating a, a 
group of allocations equivalent to 1% of the existing residential units in the city of Lakewood. Um, those allocations are then put into a series of pools. Uh, beginning in January, they're put into the open pool or the affordable pool or the hardship pool. Those three pools last through until the end of May. The first open pool and the affordable pool then end and any remaining allocations in those pools transfer into the second, uh, the second open pool. Then at the end of October, that second open pool and the hardship pool in and any remaining allocations in those two pools transfer forward to, this, to the surplus pool, which is available in the last two months of the year for any projects remaining on a first come first serve basis. Uh, the second thing that the uh, ordinance does is require public hearings. And there are two types of public hearings that are required. The first is for uh, projects, multi-unit projects of over 40 units. And the second, and I believe there was a comment on Lakewood Speaks that this may not always be required, but the second type of project for which a public hearing could be required are um, age-limited uh, uh, multifamily housing projects. Um, over the past three years, so this went into effect in 2020. Um, in both 2020 and 2021, City Council chose to make fewer than 1% uh, make allocations equal to fewer than 1%. The reason that that was done was because prior to the initiation of the ordinance, a large number of projects went through seeing what was coming in terms of the vote. And those projects were exempted from having to get allocations under the terms of the ordinance. City Council decided that um, they'd like to account for those units under the 1% cap. And so, uh, fewer than 1% were created in 2020 and 2021. Um, and in both years, far fewer allocations were actually uh, used than were created. So I think something on the order of 180, um, 183 in 2020 and 165 or somewhere around there in 2021. Uh, this current year we have still under, two, we've created the council has created over 700 allocations. I believe we have under 200 assigned so far um, in, in the current year. And I apologize for not have, being able to pull up the presentation, but uh, happy to take questions and help with the discussion any way I can. Great. Thank you, you did a nice job. And, and for folks that would like to see those slides, you can go to lakewoodspeaks.org and that presentation is posted. But I think you did a nice job remembering what was uh, on there. So uh, let's go ahead and start the discussion. I'll start with Ms. Stewart. Thank you. So I know we're here predominantly um, and have this timing tonight because the allocations in the affordable pool are set to expire at the end of May and kind of go back into the, the general pool. So I know that they're, um, the reason we're here tonight in April is because there's some urgency around our need to really discuss um, what we're gonna do as a city about the affordability crisis that we are facing, not only as a city, but as a region. Um, and there was just a, uh, an article that came out that said that Denver was the fifth least affordable in the top five. It was number five of the least affordable cities to live in right now because of the cost of housing compared to the median income. And I think that it's fairly clear that we're seeing that in Lakewood as well. Um, I have been meeting with residents and doing a lot of stakeholding on the topic of affordable housing for over a year now. Um, it's one of the great things about campaigning is you get to talk to thousands of people. <laughs> and so that is very recently on my mind. Um, and I just want to point out again the information that we received last week on Lakewood Speaks that one in two individuals in Lakewood is cost burdened when it comes to their housing. So we consider anyone cost burdened who uh, pays more than 30% of their net income to housing, which is a significant portion and 
50% of our residents are paying more than that right now, which means that we have residents who are trying to decide whether or not they can pay their rent or their mortgage or whether or not they can buy food. And I just, um, that's not right. And we need to do something about it. The demand for housing continues to go up and we just don't have enough demand to keep up with it. Um, I I want to make sure that I am keeping my remarks really specifically to affordable housing because that's, you know, why, what we're here to discuss tonight. But we exempt senior housing 55 and up from the requirements of the uh, strategic growth initiative. And it boggles my mind a little bit that we're not doing the same for affordable housing. So. I would like to suggest as an action for council to take that we actually um, exempt affordable housing uh, completely. Um, we get rid of the pool. There is so uh, there are so many issues with the timing right now. Uh, there are chaffa grants and chaffa loans and all sorts of things where a um, affordable housing developer needs to have the project guaranteed in order to even access these funds. There is so much red tape when it comes to building and financing and being able to afford to build and finance affordable housing. And so I think that we just quite frankly, in the city, this is too, this is too much. And we're seeing that no one has applied for the affordable housing allocations in the last two years. I find that incredibly concerning. We just need to do better for people who want to be able to live in our city and who need a place um, that's not going to cost them you know, a sig more than 50% of their income. That's just, um, it's just too much. So that's what I would like to suggest. I would also maybe want to have a discussion around what we're defining as affordable housing. I believe right now it's up to 140% of the area median income. Um, and I think that that, you know, may need to um, be discussed whether or not we want to, if we are if we want to pull affordable housing completely out and exempt it, like we exempt senior housing and areas of urban renewal, then I would like to perhaps look at as well what what our kind of top cap of um, what is affordable um, and how that's defined. Thanks. There were no questions, just lots of things. No, that's great. No, I appreciate that. Two, two things, do you have a number in mind that we can build off of? I know the that currently the state is putting together quite a few affordability programs and they are doing it by area. So the Denver Metro area, they're defining affordable as anything um, 80% AMI and under, um, and it's different for like the mountain resort towns, it's up to 170% AMI. So they're regionalizing it just based on the affordability of, um, you know, housing. And I, I just would like to say that um, at my job, I make 80% of the AMI. So this is teachers and social workers. This is, you know, people, this is not just individuals who are you know earning minimum wage this is a lot of uh, young professionals and essential workers as well okay. all right thank you and another nice thing i appreciate um you doing an actionable item so council if you have other actionable items as we go that way i can circle back and make sure we get consensus on on things that folks want to move forward so with that mr abel you're up thank you mayor uh that's an intriguing idea, Ms. Stewart. Uh, at present, we do, we only exempt senior projects uh, at, uh, with approval of city council. Uh, that might be a step we want to take with uh, affordable allocations. But my concern is the same as yours every year. We set aside hundreds of allocations for affordable units and they never get used. And then uh, after they expire, we have had requests to gobble them up for other uh, non-affordable uses. 
And I think that is uh, counterproductive. If I'm going to develop uh, a project and I don't want, uh, and I can wait until the affordable allocations expire and become um, available for any use, uh, you know, that, that's more effective for my bottom line. So I think we need to set aside those allocations and make it clear that, hey, you're not going to get them for market rate apartments or townhomes or attached single family uh, later in the year. These are there to help the folks that need the assistance. I also have a bit of concern with our uh, relatively high standard for affordability. I think we need to think about folks that can afford much less. Uh, and they, there are all kinds of new forms of uh, living units out there. Uh, there are uh, some that are printed. Uh, uh, that are manufactured with a uh, the printed circuit board or whatever it is. Uh, so I think we need to look at what we what our ultimate goal is, who we're trying to uh, who we're trying to aid in this uh, quest for affordability, and make sure that we're. Uh, broader in our outreach, or not outreach, broader in our view than uh, just folks that are making, uh, just the beginning teachers and police officers and firefighters and such. I mean, folks that really are uh, economically uh, challenged uh, should have a shot at home ownership as well. And, and rental homes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sharzai. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, circle back to what Councillor Stewart said, and I, I um, you know, applaud bold moves for us to consider how we're going to address some of the affordable needs in our community. But I also want to uh, consider too, like that the middle portion of our economy is the ones that seem to be facing the biggest challenges. So often when we have these conversations, we start to talk about people who live at the bottom of the area median income. And I, I don't wanna leave those folks out, but also that is not necessarily who's being left behind right now because there are a number of programs that are helping support that. It is sort of this workforce housing need that is uh, apparent across the metro area, across the state. And then I'd also just wanna, you know, circle back to at the very least we have a housing authority that it's my understanding had very little input in drafting this and so you know could we consider um how we sort of um encourage them to be able to move quicker and building things by removing restrictions from um them you know this is lakewood's housing authority i'm just i've always baffled why we put restrictions on them as well great thank you uh, Mr. Olver. Hey, thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to give a little word of warning here on messing with SGI. Um, everybody here knows that we have actually a, re we live in a republic, but the voters seem to th think that we live in a democracy. And as clo the closest they actually ever get to a democracy, and the closest we ever get to a democracy, is when we all vote on something, uh, initiative, whatever it is. And we all, all of Lakewood had the opportunity to vote on SGI and it passed. And so I don't think this body should be messing with it. Um, tweaks are fine, but, but the adding in affordable housing or no, removing affordable housing from that 1%, it, it's another, adding another giant loophole. We all know the blight is a big loophole. I mean, we've got so many loopholes that, you know, it's, it's becoming meaningless. And I think we would do the, something like that at our own peril. Um, there, 
they're going to remember. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I don't know what will happen down the road, but I really don't think we should mess with SGI as such because the people have voted for it. There, there is one caveat there. If somebody campaigned to remove SGI or to weaken it so far that it just has no teeth whatsoever and doesn't do a thing, well, then I would say, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, that's quite feasible. Um, another, an example, a different example than SGI that I think of is the marijuana the legalization of that. When we originally voted on that as citizens, I, I was all for it, but it failed. And if I had been on council right there, then I feel it would have been my duty to uphold the will of the people and to maybe, you know, since I was all for legalization uh, of recreational marijuana, uh, you know, it would have been up to me to get the people to vote on that second, the second round. So I think if we really want to make a big change, the SGI, um, it should be, it should go back to the voters. Um, as for little tweaks, um, it seems like the affordable house, no, not the affordable housing. Yeah, um, the affordable housing expiring at the end of May, I, I would be all for extending that. I don't think that changes the 1% goal of SGI at all. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Maya Guerrero. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you know, I think Councilman Olver brings up a point that is probably on everybody's mind here, right? Which is that the SGI was passed by the voters and that is a very important thing to keep in mind. I would ask that we think about a couple of things. One is who voted um, in the SGI and then on what premise or like what was the main messaging? Because obviously I cannot scientifically say, um, you know, X percent of people who voted in favor of the SGI thought it would do which thing, right? But we do know that some of the primary messages around the SGI at the time and that I have continued to hear were around and that was in the um, like the actual like legally documented reasoning behind it, right? And that was some things around thinking about affordable growth, thinking about how we want to grow and our vision for Lakewood, thinking about the environment, et cetera, right? And so I would argue that ensuring that affordable units and attainable units, uh, to, to Councilwoman Sherazai's point, like that both of those components are actually, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure that there are some people who will say, oh yeah, I voted for the SJ because I hate all that stuff. But in general, I don't think that that was really the spirit. And again, I don't, I don't want to go down too much of a slippery slope of speculation. You can see that it's written in the reasoning behind it. And you heard it in almost all of the like, messaging on social media and, you know, the lit and everything that came out about it at the time did not say like, let's stop making Lakewood affordable for people. And I think we are living in a crisis right now. We have gotten to use the SGI for a couple of years and it didn't do that, right? It just didn't actually achieve what, what people thought it might. And so I think we have a responsibility to take, to have these really, really hard discussions that might feel risky um, because we have to serve our community. Uh, so that's my first point on the on intention, but I also would just like to remind us too that the SGI was passed in a July election. So that's a weird time to vote basically. And what we know, and this is this is science, right? That me, what, what did people intend when they voted for it? That's a little speculatory, right? What we know as a fact is that when you move dates of elections and you don't have them, you know, at that basically like the fall time when everyone knows to be looking for elections, uh, you end up seeing a dramatic drop off in terms of voter turnout. And really specifically the types of voters that you see not to vote in those types of special elections and weird timed elections are people of color, are college educated single females, are lower income people, are single parents, are people who work multiple jobs, Right, the list kind of goes on. And so you think about like, who, who are we serving? We're, ser we're serving all of the voters and all of the residents of Lakewood, right? Not just the ones who turned out in July. And so when you look at how thin that margin of, of voting was, like it was a very, very small percent um, of people, you have to also think about like, wow, the fact that it was in that timing, how would that have been different in November? 
because we know for a fact that different people turn out with those types of elections. And so I just think that's another important thing. Like this feels like a little bit of a logical fallacy to say like, oh, it passed by this very tiny amount at this special election that, um, you know, did, you know, unintentionally exclude all of these voters who like didn't know to be voting then um, and say that that is the ironclad will of the people. It, it just feels like a really false point to me. All right, Ms. Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. I certainly want to thank everybody for all the, the good feedback. Um, just picking up on the timing of that election, that certainly was meant to go at a regular election. It was due to a challenge that was brought that forced it. So I just wanted the community to realize it was not timed to disenfranchise voters. It was a legal challenge that was brought um, under some, some difficult circumstances that brought it to that timing. So the intention, I, I don't believe, was to disenfranchise voters. It's just how it worked out with the legal challenge. Um, picking up again on what some of the other folks have been saying, though, because of the way funding works for uh, affordable and attainable housing and the challenges involved in it, I do believe we've got to look at changing it in such a way where maybe they either don't expire or the pool is a carryover where we can engage those uh, those developers who want to build those types of products. Because I'm hearing from people in our community, their children can't afford to stay. They've graduated from college. They want to live close to family and friends. And they really can't. Um, a, a neighbor recently, their son, I think, moved to South Dakota, um, not because he wanted to, but because he just couldn't afford to be here. And that certainly puts a burden on, on folks. So I just want to folks to know on council that I'm open to looking at um, you know, what do we do with those pools? How do we honor what the voters had intended? Um, and again, we can't be too speculative. We don't know what each one of them thought, but certainly people were concerned about development moving at a pace that the infrastructure wasn't moving at. Um, maybe there were things in the zoning code that caused folks concern about higher densities that were incompatible in certain areas. So I think that as we move through that, we certainly need to keep those things in mind. Um, but it is going to be important that we find ways to overcome what I'm going to call the process challenges so we can get those folks um, sort of in the process where they have those guarantees of allocations when they start to move through that process of looking for those dollars, which are scarce and which other communities are uh, vying for just as much as we would be. So just wanted to, that my fellow counselors to hear that certainly open to a robust conversation around those points. Great. Thank you. So I, I appreciate uh, the suggestion and, and certainly trying to fine tune what what does that look like with the affordability and, and where do we go? I will say that I feel that if we could open up, open it up. So affordable projects are so complicated and they take the path of least resistance. And so what I was fearful of is that all of our affordable housing would be in our blighted areas because they're exempt. And I think that people should be able to afford to live throughout our whole community and there shouldn't be an undue concentration of affordable units in a certain area. And unfortunately we have that. And I've said before, in some ways, it, it seems like it's redlining, right? And, and we wanna be that inclusive community that's allowing for everybody. So to Ms. Frank's point too, I think what we've also heard parallel to trying to make sure we honor the SGI, our efforts around what are we building? How is it looking? What do setbacks look like? What are open space requirements? And a lot of that's tracked through the development dialogue committee that's looked at changing and updating our ordinances to look at how we grow and what that looks like. So I think this is a, an opportune time and, and this may not be the be all end all, it might just be the start of a, a further conversation as things may need to be tweaked. You know, for me personally, I don't think spot lighting is amazing. However, I, I certainly understand why we, we have that and, and have to use that opportunity sometimes. So just a couple of thoughts there. And, and again, so far, just checking in, I've heard one actionable item and um, we can continue on that road. That'd be great. So Ms. Springsteen, your hand is up. Uh, 
<clears throat> well, I, I just wanted to make a couple points. Um, you know, this, this problem with affordable and attainable housing is not something restricted to Lakewood. I mean, what you're talking about with that fifth most expensive place to live is about the metro area. It's about the entire state. And so I I just think we should be careful not not to to blame the the problems with affordable housing going on here in Lakewood strictly on SGI. Um, you know, and that said, again, and I've talked about this before, but the area of Denver that I come from, um, and I was just on this street two days ago, uh, they, they are building like crazy all the, all the beautiful cottage homes where families with 10 little kids who were people of color lived. Um, are all being knocked down and it's all being gentrified and it's all young professionals who are white who live there. And so this consistent trying to twist SGI into it's something racist, it's something exclusionary, we don't like people of color, that's just not fair. What the intention was to avoid what I'm talking about in Denver. And so when we have a situation where the affordable housing allocations are not even being used, not even being utilized over the last few years, and some of you weren't on council yet, when we heard from the woman from the Metro West Housing Authority and heard about what it would take to be able to do projects like that, just our intentions in writing to Chaffa would be enough for them to proceed. And so my concern is um, if we're trying to do this balancing act and, and we are still a democracy, so we do have to, um, we do have to respect the vote, even if we think some people weren't able to make it, but if we want to, you know, walk this tightrope, we really need to consider our steps in how we're going about it. And certainly we all want more affordable housing. I, I think we all agree on that. It's just how do we attain that and do that without disrespecting our voters or dismantling what we do have in place. So I think this is a good discussion. I just think that we need to quit villainizing somebody who may have a slightly different view on how to get there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I have Mr. Abel, Ms. Mayak Guerrero, and then back to Ms. Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, boy, some of this... Some things I've just heard make me wonder. Um, in fact, I believe it was a lady, uh, one of the uh, representatives from uh, Chapter Colorado Housing uh, um, and Finance, uh, who said that all they need to uh, okay a project is a letter from council saying the allocations are available. That's how Golden does it. Uh, so we're not really taking anything off the table for uh, the Lakewood Housing Authority. What's taking things off the table for the Housing Authority, uh, Archway, and other providers of affordable uh, properties is the uh, high demand for market rate uh, apartments in townhomes and units um, that's raising the price of dirt all over town. You can't buy a developable spot for a um, the reasonable price. And that, that in, more than anything, affects how, how well our, our uh, housing authority and other uh, providers of affordable housing can function. Uh, and I am 
we wouldn't be talking about safe parking here in a couple of weeks if all those needs were being met for folks on the lower end of the uh, economic scale. All you have to do is open your eyes and you will see that those folks are in abundance and, uh, and need help as much as anyone, maybe more than most. Uh, also, SGI had been set for a November election and a challenge from uh, a fellow that was recruited by an attorney named Dennis Polk uh, held it up for two years on little basis at all. It won no points at all in any uh, judicial venue that it uh, was presented to. It came about in uh, summertime because that's when it uh, when it was uh, released from uh, ballot jail, uh, and the small margin. I mean, it, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the margin of uh, uh, SGI, the winning margin, was more than the mayor's winning margin in his first mayoral race. But yet, he's mayor for all of us and has been for eight years. So I, uh, I think putting all of this in context, what we need to do is to protect the allocations for affordable housing that are on the table right now and take some action to assure that those remain on the table for at least the rest of the year and maybe even roll over into next year. That's a topic for discussion, but we do need to do something now. And we need to do it with uh, a thought about widening its effect and how we make housing affordable to the most needy of us. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to Ms. Strom since she has not had the floor in her hand up, and then I'll go to Ms. Maya Guerrero and then Ms. Stewart. Thank you. Um, so, to Councilman Over's point about not making significant shifts, because yeah, I think I think we all understand. Um, the reason for this, uh, or the, the the reason for fourteen twenty seven, and and how things came about, and that you know, Lakewood has. We want to preserve the Lakewood that we love. We all move here for a reason. We love where we are. So there's a big element of that. So that's very very crucial. But at the same point, making sure that we're continuing to provide housing for people that are here. We were all blessed in the the ability to to land here ourselves. Um, so it's maintaining the lakewood we love, maintaining the visibility, the the outdoor ability, and all of the you know Colorado way of life. I get that. Um, if we, to Councillor Stewart's point of in, including affordable as a, um, I don't know the right word, but exempted, if that's the right word, from the allocations, maybe something to consider would be to reconsider having blight be something that makes something no longer eligible or no longer necessary for the allocation. So it's kind of you're switching one for the other. That's one thing that's bubbling up in my mind. But I do think to um, Councillor Frank's point, there's a lot of administrative burden that goes along with this um, ordinance. And that you know, there was the thing in public comment that talked about how many staff hours that are part of that. Introducing some things like carrying over allocations. Um, we all love our rollover minutes, right? at and sometimes we need them, sometimes we don't. But carrying over allocations, I do think is something that could make it easier to administer, but also a little bit less um, questioning on whether or uncertainty on whether or not allocations would be available. And then having them not 
expire. I do think are also some options that we look at there. But I think too, as a, a, as a council, one of the things that's going on is that what's a, impacting affordability and the ability and barriers that are out there to ownership opportunities for um, people getting into the housing market is that Colorado in general, you know, per statute, we've got challenges that are really disincentivizing our builders building things that could be affordable like condos, multifamily and the like. And so what I would love to see also is we, we have this conversation that's important, but us leaning to, you know, not unlike we last week, we brought up the idea of having a proclamation for Save Our Bear Creek Lake Park and reevaluating what they're looking at for consideration of flooding up the park. But also, I do think that we need to consider um, reaching out, putting a little pressure maybe on our state legislators to change some of those rules because it's not just a Lakewood thing. Obviously, there are parts of it that are, but I do think it's important for us to examine the greater part of it and back to the whole fifth least affordable um, place to live. That's also a Colorado component, too. So I know that that was a lot, but that's fine. Great. Thank you. Ms. Mia Carrero? Thank you. Um... It's kind of like a handful of things. I'm kind of just saying where to start. I think one one thing is I would love at some point in this conversation or when it's you know appropriate in the conversation to get clarification over what Golden does. I feel I feel like we might somebody on staff might already know that. Um, and because my understanding is quite different actually, I think than yours, Councilman Abel, which is that I thought that the way that they handled their affordable housing allocations was that they essentially it, it, it wasn't like it's not so much just like a written intention that it's actually you know codified and it's it's statutory that you can essentially qualify for all of your allocations up front and then you get them over the course of like building which takes several years right but you actually have them firmly legally allocated not just on like a letter of recommendation or what have you from from the council but that you're they're fully approved really um through, through that time period. So I think that would be a really significant change to the way that we bank things. Um, so I, but I, I would love, I would just love clarification on that because I think you and I were looking at the same thing and it came up slightly differently and um, would love clarification because that, that does seem to be helpful. Um, <clears throat> but I will, you know, I also do want to say, um, I mean, it definitely is, a, it, it definitely is a regional issue. And I don't think that exempting affordable housing will totally solve it and you know councilman springsteen to your point i just i just want to make it clear i i have strong feelings about the sgi but i'm not actually trying to vilify it because i think that it came about because we're in a place of of problem right and it came about because people to your point don't want to see the overtaking of you know unaffordable sort of not really well thought out growth um and i i feel that too so so much like so much so no i i don't think that anybody who's in favor of the sg i don't i don't think that that's a you know it's not my it wasn't my follow wax it wasn't my preferred solution but like that the acute problem that made that led to it and like the fact that you know i think that there is some real you know merit to the ideas around it I'm not here to vilify it. That is not what I'm trying to do. I think that we're all experiencing some similar problems and it's really a matter of how do we get to the solution. So I just really appreciated how you framed that councilwoman Springsteen. Um, that it's about, you know, we need to be problem solving really. Um, and I, I did also want to return a little bit to, you know, part of this issue with spotlighting is that we can't, there's a couple of issues, right? One is that we're not going to look at a holistic vision and plan for an area and then two it's very uh difficult to actually like negotiate on specific developments um once an area is blighted so for those that don't know in ward two which is you know northeast lakewood there um has been quite a lot of of blighting and it is a primary way that many buildings are being built here and it's near the light rail so in terms of you know transit oriented development that's quite good right there 
uh, relatively dense near like centers and where it was already, you know, like where that density makes more sense than in other parts of Lakewood. However, right, like our ability in some ways has been restricted to actually negotiate with each developer about their vision and make sure that the you know, community has the input that they should have and make sure that we have the input that we should have. And that, you know, from like a sustainability, affordability, inclusivity from like all of those kinds of things, and then also visually design wise. So I, I want to recognize that we've been making some of these tools, right? Like we're going to see the development menu, like we talked about, which will have some design issues, have some sustainability things. Um, but it's to me, I'm like, okay, we're in such an acute place of pressure that whatever we need to do to allow people to most easily access the existing structures like Chaffa to support affordable housing being built, we need to do it. So if that's exempting affordable housing, then I'm uh, from the allocations, I'm in favor of it. If it's fully changing the banking, fine. Um, I feel agnostic a little bit to the approach, except that like I, I do worry about having any red tape in the way. But I think that that has to be the start of this broader conversation about how are we really negotiating with developers like as a city? How are we positioning ourselves to be able to do that with the community on behalf of the community both ways? Like, how are we really able to do that case by case as needed? Right. And we can't really do that with the SGI. And then um, the and then to me, the other then the other thing is, how are we making all of the rest of these things? Right. Like, how are we creating um, the the to Councilman Abel's point with the, the people who are sort of in the most dire straits, how are we providing for them? And how are we creating, you know, attainable housing, workforce housing, and housing that people can buy at those levels um, are all questions that I think we need to be answering. They're coming up here. And I'm like, okay, well, the, the first thing to me is like, get rid of what we're doing that's, pre that's preventing some of that system. And then we can really dig in on like that broader conversation of like, okay, what are the, what are the rest of the tools we need to create? To, to make this happen. So to me, I feel like there's like a, a right here, like we're gonna have our, our credits go away kind of like question. And then there's like the next, then the next question, which we need to be answering urgently, but maybe not quite as urgently as this affordable credits problem. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Parker, did you wanna, are you able to clarify the, the original question about Golden? Certainly, yeah, that, that's actually um, the change or one of the only changes that Golden has made over the years is uh, realizing that they, yeah, they weren't accomplishing affordable housing with their original uh, for, with their original ordinance. And the change that they made was, I believe what was articulated, affordable projects now can just start building immediately. So let's say there's a 200 unit affordable project in Golden they can they can go out and get their building permit, and then those uh, uh, units receive allocations moving forward. So they're still you know accounted for in the one percent, uh, but they don't have to wait and collect those allocations and then build later, which proved to be a problem golden for the provision of affordable housing. Thank you. So uh, Miss Jansen, your, your hands up, please. Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Okay, so when my family moved to Lakewood back in 1965, there was nothing south of Alameda. Lots of open fields, lots of places to build, um, lots of opportunities for everyone. We had jobs everywhere. Now we, now we, are, we are at the end um, where we wanna keep our open space. So it's kind of like, what do we want to do? I mean, are we going to blight certain areas and build multifamily housing? Is that is that the direction you want to go? Um, which means the apartments, which I heard when I was on the campaign trail, people didn't want that. They don't want the, the big apartments. Um, of course, and I understand, but people need a place to live. Um, and we are at the we are at our borders. We are busting at the seams. And I'm like saying, you know, Boulder also has a strategic growth. Um, and I'd like to know how they're doing it. Um, are, are, they, are they closed up too? Are they are expanding? They have a lot of areas that they can go to and are they're doing the same thing too in Boulder. So 
I understand everybody's frustrated. It is. It's very frustrating. I mean, you can you can rationalize things, and and then you can, and then you can't because there's just the the supply is not there. Um, the demand is, and that's why we have the cost issues. Um, if we had more land, we could we could build more. And that's that's all I've got for that. So uh, yeah, that's where I'm at with it. Barb, thank you so much because I really I, I agree with you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, Ms. Franks, and then we'll wrap it back around to Ms. Stewart and and, and go from there. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, I know Councillor Strom had earlier had mentioned the administrative piece. I actually was not commenting on that piece. Mine was infrastructure, but that did bring up a point. We did have a comment on Lakewood Speaks that talked to a very significant amount of administrative overhead. So I think that that would be important. So that is an ask that I would like to make of the city manager and Mr. Parker would be, it's going to be important for us to understand sort of the administrative uh, costs associated. And so we can factor in those administrative costs of making additional changes that could add to that burden. It's not that we would maybe shy away from it, but it's always good to have information. Um, the second ask that I would have is, I know that the, the, the woman from Chaffa spoke before us, and we certainly have our Lakewood Housing Authority. Uh, we have a long-term uh, leader um, in that organization. I would be wanting to hear from them, either in written form or coming before us, to say, what are the things that are preventing? Is it competition, like Councilor Abel said? Is it really the cost of land, where they're out in competition and they're unable to make purchases? Because then that might be a tool that we can we can bring to bear in some different ways. If they're saying that it uh, the letter is what they would need to get those guarantees to get us moving forward, like uh, maybe golden, what do they need in order to have those assurances? Um, are there other levers that we're not thinking about, other um, barriers to them, uh, you know, uh, you know, finding um, opportunity? Um, and that speaks back to uh, Mayor Paul's point that certainly it's important, in at least in my view, that you do not centralize or um, congregate uh, too much of our properties that are um, affordable and attainable because it should be a community experience. Um, and I do believe in that. Um, I do want to make sure that we also, and I don't know if it's exactly topical, but as population grows and we are in a semi-arid state, I think that we really need to understand what the water uh, concerns are. I, I would like to understand from Denver Water, you know, what are their plans? You know, are they going to be looking at legislative solutions where we have less turf to water? I mean, those are all concerns that my community, when I was campaigning, it's been a number of years ago now, but it's the burden on the streets. If you put multifamily where the, where the infrastructure doesn't uh, doesn't support it, who pays for either the widening of that? Who's impacted? Water, um, rec centers. If we start to overburden our services to to community members. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think it's a broad discussion. I definitely am interested in it happening. And I gave at least a couple action items in there that I think we can pursue. Great. And, I, and I'd say there's probably a sliver from, from every piece tonight of, you know, none of this is the magic solution, right? It's a little bit here, a little bit there, and nothing is causing all the problems also, right? And we've seen that with the $400 million the state's trying to put out in uh in arpa dollars uh going forward so we have a couple of actionable items and and i think maybe this twofold could take one you know coming tonight about the affordability piece and what do we do with the pressing time and then maybe continuing to gather a lot of these other questions in relation to how things work and i will tell you because i often ask to go testify before chaffa for these projects and, and that is the board's number one concern when they are inquiring about lakewood and tax credits is the sgi and how it works and how those allocations are, are spent so i've been to three of those and that was top of mind at every interview when i was advocating for these types of projects so miss stewart maybe you can wrap us back here and and see if we can find some sort of direction on, on the affordable piece tonight. And then again, keeping a, a nugget to what we've heard also the, some of these other things for further conversations. 
great. I will do all the things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just want to say that I really appreciate the dialogue tonight. I love that, you know, for the most part, we're all on the same page. I think we want people to be able to afford to live in Lakewood. And I realize that there are different solutions, um, but I think that it's okay to try things. And I think it's okay to fail. Um, you know, I think we need to, that's just okay. That has to be okay. We have to do what um, we need to do for our community. I totally understand and appreciate the fact that this is a regional issue and Lakewood is not going to solve the housing crisis in Metro Denver. I totally realize that. But I don't want that to be a reason that we don't do anything and that we don't try something. Um, and as far as speaking to process, I have done a lot of stakeholding with our housing authority um, to see what the barriers are that they see in front of them. And this suggestion that I made tonight was the biggest thing that I think we could do to make sure that we're removing barriers. Like um, Councilwoman Mayor Guerrero said, we just have to do something. These allocations are expiring and this is a pressing and very present issue. And we have to do something to remove the bar as many barriers. And I would say as many barriers as, as possible because I don't think there's a person here um, who would argue that this is a huge, we're reaching a crisis point with housing affordability. And so my desire to um, completely exempt affordable units of under 80 AMI is an attempt to do everything possible and to use all the tools at our disposal in, in an action to be able to make sure that we're removing as many barriers as we possibly can, whether it's administrative, process, anything like that. Just, you know, we have these tools at our disposal and I would suggest that we use them. And, you know, again, mm -hmm. it's okay to try things and it's okay sure. to try I'm okay with that. <laughs> Well, we could certainly, you know, if, if that is a suggestion that does go forward, then we could certainly, to Ms. Frank's request, have the Housing Authority weigh in on that piece, especially as it relates to AMI. I know after speaking or being part of the sub the sub panel group for the state uh, ARPA funds, it's really tough. There's a lot of different ways people look at AMI and what that number should be. And certainly, I think it can be helpful visually to see, well, this is what you need to, you know, this is how much you need to make to afford this or that. And really, you know, going from, you know, 12, 13, $14 an hour, you know, to our kind of first line workers, that's all very important to understand where we hit that sweet spot. So we're not excluding teachers and, and firefighters. We're also making sure that the entry level workers are, are able to live in our community that they serve. So, yeah. so I guess if you wanted an actual action, I would say we, I would like to see um, an ordinance from staff exempting all affordable units of under 80 AMI from the from 1427's requirements. Okay, thank you. I have Miss um, Franks. I'm going to go to Miss Vincent first. She has not spoke tonight, and then I'll go over to what looks like. Did I lose you? Did you lose me? No, I have you, but I think oh, okay. Frank's. people are getting kicked out. So go ahead. Ms. Vincent. I've been kicked out all night. Yeah. Um, would you consider just removing the um, exemptions or, or for affordable housing without looking at the specific AMI now? Because as Mayor Paul said, there's a lot of different ways of looking at that. That way we have the exemptions and then maybe we can get some additional information around that for us to consider. Okay. She gave a thumbs up. Okay. Ms. Jensen, please. Sorry, it takes me a while to get that unmute button off. Um, do you think our community should be polled in the next looking at Lakewood just so that we can um, that we can advertise this discussion? so that the community can actually have more input on this? Um, so 
So twofold. So our, our looking at Lakewood uh, info is due today at five. And, um, <laughs> we are uh, we are the elected body, right? And it does state that these ordinances after six months can be changed by the legislative body, which is us. And then to further promote this, uh, Ms. Hodson made sure that the plain language was put on the agenda um, at request by Ms. Franks so that there wasn't any confusion for folks who might not know what 14.27 is. Now, with that said, I think what we're hearing tonight, this is gonna be an ongoing conversation and something that should be taking place at every ward meeting, I would say, moving forward and getting as many people. However, we are dealing with the affordable piece tonight, which does have a timely nature because I think those end up at the end of May. So that's what we're up against. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Ms. Franks, you're back. I am. I don't know. The hand just kept doing its part. So, um, so no, I, I really want to say I really appreciate what we're trying to accomplish, but I don't know that I'm going to be comfortable completely exempting it. I, when you look at the histor history of the usage and the community's desire for the cap, I certainly want to explore it. But where I would be positioned is for one, for them not the pool, not to, for them not to go into the general pool. And for two, for us to start looking at a carryover year to year and also partner with uh, Chaffa and our housing authority to say, how can we pre-allocate them if they've got projects coming up? So I really want to facilitate it, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable completely exempting that when then we have the exemption for uh, multiple ones, plus we still have blight and we're still not consuming. And I want Mr. Parker to weigh on this. I don't believe we're still consuming at the 1%. I think since SGI has been in place, we've not yet consumed at that level. So certainly I think non-expiring may be a way in which we can get these set aside. So I'd really like just a touch of dialogue before we close. Certainly. Um, Mr. Parker, did you wanna address that piece, and then I'll go to Mr. Abel has his hand up. Uh, certainly, a as of yet, yes, we we've, we've, haven't consumed obviously any affordable allocations and we haven't even come close to consuming the number of allocations that council has designated in the open pool. So I think year one, it was 180, year two, it was 160 or vice versa, one of those two. Um, and both years, more open pool, uh, allocations were created at the beginning of the year than either of those numbers. So yeah, uh, we're still not not consuming many allocations, period. Thank you. Mr. Abel, then Ms. Strom. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Parker for clarifying how Golden does this. They do indeed move their uh, allocations to the front of the line now. The way they got their first project was to guarantee the allocations for Ch uh, through Chaffa. So uh, I think right now, the what we need to do is to assure that these allocations are extended past the May deadline, through the end of the year at least. The discussions uh, of, of the broader issues of uh, SGI, that's going to take us a while. But I think that the quickest thing we can do now and the most effective is to uh, extend the lifespan of the affordable allocation so that the affordable pool that is set aside in uh, January uh, extends through at least the end of the year. So I think it would be a lot easier uh, and more efficient to deal with that now and then have our conversations on uh, the larger issue around SGI and affordability uh, for a later date. Thank you. Ms. Strom? Thank you. I just had a question as far as affordable affordable units. And do we know of the buildings that have been deemed blighted that are being redeveloped over the last couple of years? Are we keeping track? Do we know how many of those are affordable units? Because yes, they've been exempted, but 
do we know how many have been built in the city despite the blight exemption on their um, previous structure? So uh, an important thing to keep in mind is the development process is a two or three year process. And so the buildings that are coming out of the ground right now are buildings that were going through the planning process in you know 2019. 2020. So everything that's been blighted um, by the council in the last two years, I don't think any building permits have actually been pulled for any of those yet, right? Those are still going through the planning process um, and won't be coming out of the ground in construction for another year or more. So th the answer is we don't know yet. Okay. So I, I have consensus that we want to address affordability. Is that accurate? <laughs> okay. And we want to address what's happening based upon what's going to expire in a couple of weeks. Is that accurate? Okay. And then, of course, there's larger, which we have the larger issues and a lot of them. So I've heard one is exempt and let them go at 80. I've heard one is don't let them expire and potentially let them pool into next year. Is there anything else in between those two that's kind of have bubbled up to the top? Okay. So Ms. Mayak Guerrero, go ahead. It's just a question about that second one of clarification, which is, yeah, I'm hearing the not let them expire, but is it, not letting them expire sort of with that combination of like people being able to bank them on the front end. I feel like that point is an important component if that's the angle we end up taking. So maybe going with the golden model is, is another add on to that, where if you're an afford, affordable project, they're not going to, well, you would negate them expiring because you just get them on the front end. Right. So I think that they would need to also not expire until at least the end of the year, but then the banking would also be able to need to be possible. So I'd love to see if that's what folks who are more in that camp were thinking, just because I think if they just don't expire, it doesn't actually like solve all these problems if the banking component is important, but I'm not, I'm, this is me not really like lobbying for that specifically, but just like trying to have like an accurate repeat back of the discussion. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Thank you. Uh, we're talking an awful lot about affordable. Um, I would think if we go ahead with something like this, that all the, well, not all the builders, but some developers will just come along and say, what I want to build is going to be affordable. And then we go, yep, go for it. And, and then we wind up later, no, nah, it really wasn't all that affordable. Um, so what are we doing to define affordable affordability and how do we going to enforce it down the road um, along those lines? If, like that exact example, somebody comes along and says, I'm going, I want to build 200 units and they're going to be affordable. And we go, yeah. So how, how do we go? Yeah. And I know it's going to be difficult because like you said, two to three, it, you know, the shovel don't hit the ground for a couple of years. And considering that I, I assume that we're in a housing bubble right now, I mean, things that are not affordable today could be affordable late down the road and things that are affordable you know, the other way around. So how do we track all this stuff? That's where I'm wondering. Uh, that's, that's a great question. And, and I think it is spelled out in the current SGI as what affordable is. And then if you do a tax credit project, you have to basically agree that those will be affordable for a lifespan of 50 to 75 to 100 years in that category. But Mr. Parker, is there anything you wanted to weigh in on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it, you hit it. It would be very similar to the way the tra tax credits do it, right? Like, like projects get tax credits by pledging per, uh, affordability, either in perpetuity or for a certain number of years. And that's tracked now, you know, by CHAPA. Um, for their program, we would certainly adopt a, you know, based on what the council does, we'd ad certainly adopt a similar program and follow similar rules to track it. It's, it's certainly doable. Okay. 
So, you know, one other op- option we have is, is if we don't have consensus tonight, there could at least be consensus to draft with two different things, right? And that way the community can weigh in. So that would be the potential front loading with a rollover um, or a non-expiration rollover and then a front loading with a total exemption for affordable based on a certain AMI. So why don't we go to public input and um, let's listen to the community. Uh, I know Mr. Hensley, you have your hand up and I know Ms. Draper will get you brought over after that. So again, three minutes when you're at two and a half, you'll hear and when your time is up, you'll hear it again. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. My name is Ben. I'm the pastor of Lakewood United Methodist Church. I live in Ward 2. I believe strongly that the affordable housing allocation pool in the SGI needs to be removed, and the SGI needs to be amended with an absolute exemption for affordable housing development based on some kind of reasonable threshold of at or near AMI in our city. The SGI is profoundly inadequate in making it possible for affordable housing to be developed in our city. Uh, going forward. While in place, there is little to no chance that affordable housing development projects can receive the financing they need from Chaffa. I've had conversations with people who are intimately familiar with Chaffa's financing practices to develop affordable housing across the state of Colorado myself, and they find this growth cap to be procedurally and structurally prohibitive for affordable housing and developing it. The amount of LIHTC available for affordable housing is, to begin with, unbelievably inadequate for the amount of affordable housing units we actually need as well in the metro area. Chaffa will always have more stable developments to finance that don't get hamstrung by city policy in places other than Lakewood. It would be an incredible use of our city's time to receive input from them about how this growth cap affects affordable housing development in the coming years for our city. The entire state of Colorado has an affordable housing deficit of over 250,000 units. Many Chaffa projects take multiple years with multiple applications as everyone is competing for an absurdly small amount of LIHTC for their upfront equity needs to begin with. You can't develop or even print affordable housing if you can't pay for it. The pool needs to be struck from the SGI. I'm not shocked that Lakewood has had no affordable housing allocations used since 2020. We've created a system where there is no real incentive to develop them. Housing markets, prices notwithstanding. Are we really building an inclusive city when this slow growth initiative contributes to gentrification? Causing demand and capping growth will cause housing costs for everyone to rise. This benefits homeowners who can enjoy the rising equity they will have with their homes more than benefiting those who are just as much residents here but might be renting or experiencing homelessness instead. There have been tax credit projects before this ballot measure took hold and some really groundbreaking work done by the likes of Metro West in particular in Lakewood. I bike past the Teller Station Crossing development a lot and I see it as a golden example of how affordable housing not only benefits those who need that affordable housing to live in the area, but also to the beauty it adds to the area. It is a gem in the Two Creeks neighborhood. Yet, the SGI, as it is written, virtually guarantees that no other developments like that will find adequate financing to proceed going forward. Our housing authority has a long and proven track record of moving tax credit projects forward successfully, and they cannot navigate the situation. This demonstrates a procedural and structural flaw. Basically, it's too expensive to live here. The SGI is going to make it worse the longer its current iteration with the affordable housing allocation pool is left in place. Let's get it out of the way so we can see more successful affordable housing developments make our neighborhoods in Lakewood better. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Can we bring Miss? Draper over and then we'll have Mr. Comden. If anybody else wishes to speak, please uh, go ahead and press star nine. Good evening, Ms. Draper. We'll get you started. Good evening. Thank you for listening. And um, I am a strong proponent of the SGI and I did vote for it with full knowledge and and preparation as a voter. And I am not um, representative of all uh, I am a BIPOC woman and I still know how to vote. I agree with Kathy Kempner's Lakewood Speaks comments. I thank some of the um, counselors who are discussing some of the fire points of having both affordable housing and citizen input, community input, preserving open spaces possible. And with the, the SGI has not, uh, use their allocations every year. And what we've seen is citizens primarily built 
has been large view blocking monolith uh, multifamily that even, even some of them were not approved, but that we have seen as noticeable. It's, it's good to have growth along light rail. I suggest that you embrace the intention of the SGI and then change policy, change vision. We do not need to kowtow to developers. Could Lakewood develop a vision that's even grander than we can't, we can't. Could we consult with CU solar engineers and Denver water saving experts and look at sustainable designs for the future? Could Lakewood encourage sustainable, affordable senior housing by policy changes? I suggest if Lakewood City Council is going to uh, do a municipal legislation ordinance, it shouldn't be to limit what the voters have said, but to engage a vision that changes Lakewood policy. Additionally, I would like to say that affordable housing is important for teachers, firefighters, and people with income limits. Uh, I would encourage you in the future to avoid some of the income limitations and equity skimming um, structures for affordable housing, such as what's seen in Stapleton condos and townhomes, which I researched. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Comden. Hello? You are, uh, yep, you are unmuted. Okay, so uh, I wonder if some of the issue with getting affordable housing here has to do with this uh, this requirement for for uh, projects that are over forty units that have to come before council. I mean, as I commented in the in the written statement, I live in an apartment complex that has. 103 units i don't think that would have been approved had it had the sgi been in place back in the 80s um very close to where i live is this abandoned building and it's almost come up in front of council for being approved but i guess because they want to build more than 40 units and it they end up polling uh getting that in front of council I don't know what the reasons are, but I assume it's they know they don't have the votes and they don't want to bring it up at the time, something like that. And so by using this uh, 40 limit, this could also be putting pressure on stopping any affordable uh, units from being built. I mean, as a personal thing, I don't fit within the affordable category. I actually uh, make a good amount of money right now and got a raise recently. But I live in, I, I'm in this kind of weird income bracket where I'm not, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't be in the affordable category, but I'm definitely not in the category that can afford a home in these prices. So I'm, I'm just renting in a, in a simple apartment, hoping that uh, things will get better and hoping you all make the right decisions to allow people like me to stay here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else wish to speak on this subject? Please raise your hand now, star nine. Okay, go ahead and close public input. I wanna to try to get us somewhat to a consensus. Um, so, Is there a consensus to front load on affordable? I just want to see shakes of yes or no's. And, and granted, this would just be to develop the ordinance going forward. And so, you know, we take that. So I'm getting a consensus on the front loading piece, if affordable. Now, the other piece, which is we've heard a little bit about, is what number do we put that at? Do we do 140? Do we do 80? Um, and I think normally if we had the time, 
we would have probably another study session available to us to look at where does that go. And also we're going to have a housing study that is going to probably help guide that also. So is there a way to go to move this forward that would suffice at least until some of these things, because we know we're going to continue to revisit this and have these conversations. So if there's a brilliant mind that wants to weigh in and help me, thank you, Ms. Strong. Anything it can do to help. Um, so would a possible solution be extending affordable through the, the affordable pool through the end of the year? Um, that would give us time to hear from CAFA, um, hear from Metro West, and I don't know any how what's the timing of that housing study does that even extending them through the end of the year does that at least buy us some time that might make it less of a barrier for someone seeking affordable it's a great question mr parker do we know what the time frame is on the on the study on the study from dola um it, it you know, we're going to spend the next couple of months doing our I don't think this, the study will be finished this, this calendar year. Okay. Mr. Abel. Not claiming to be the uh, great thinker that you were suggesting. However, uh, I think Ms. Strom has the answer. We, we need to deal with these allocations that are going to expire in May. And the most efficient way to do it is to do just that and then come back to the larger discussion. So I would suggest that we have staff craft legislation that would uh, extend the lifespan of the affordable allocations at least through the end of the year. And we can talk about rollover uh, uh, along those lines as well. But if we try to fix all of these problems now, we're going to get bogged down. And May is going to come and go. And we will, for the third year in a row, have lost hundreds of affordable allocations. So I think we need to go ahead with that part of it as soon as possible. Make the first issue, the first uh, the legislation that comes before us as quick and easy as we can. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Mayor Guerrero. Um, I think that for me, the summary and, and suggestion is relatively similar to Council and Abel's about, you know, let's, let, we, we urgently must address the affordable housing pool really specifically. And then I, I, it does seem very clear that this is the beginning of more of these conversations, which I'm, you know, kind of excited about, um, like really thinking about how we're codifying some of these needs around affordability, open space, et cetera, and doing a lot of various broader types of policy shifts, um, not just in the SGA, like that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, like in general, like how are we achieving um, some of these goals? Um, but to, to me, I think the delaying of allocations, like, I mean, the I, for me, I'm still where Councilwoman Stewart, what she first brought up, which was to exempt affordable housing credits to essentially just, you know, pull them out. And I think, you know, I, I defer to somebody who's more technical than me on these things in terms of like how to do that in the way that still, you know, recognizes and fits within the, this broader system because it's not like then our on the books thing that's what affordable housing is right it does i get i get that it starts to unravel a little bit but to me i think actually just exempting affordable units and ex affordable projects is like a, a more straightforward way to do it um but of course if that's just like not where anyone else is going to be at then that's okay okay thank you uh, Mr. Olver and then Ms. Franks. Yeah, I'd like to 
go along with what uh, Charlie and Wendy are saying. That is something I could go along. It doesn't really change SGI majorly. It's still 1%. Um, so that, you know, it's something we can do now, and I would definitely go along with that. Um, as for adding in affordable, you know, excluding affordable units, no, I, I can't go along with that. That That's a major change to SGI. Um, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Franks. And I can be fairly quick. I, I agree with what the others have said as far as um, I can't go along with exempting it because number one, it's not been defined. I think that that becomes a very, uh, you know, that becomes a discussion um, of what affordable is. And I think we need data points to do that. So uh, I'm certainly prepared to um, extend them through the end of the year. Look forward to robust discussion as we move forward, but can't support an exemption without knowing all the metrics around it. Thank you. Ms. Shahrzai. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I would, um, I just wouldn't want to lose this conversation. So I do uh, respect Councillor Abel's suggestion and, you know, not gumming up the works and complicating this. There's a, a quick solution, but I also don't think that that is the solution. I think that we have a bigger conversation to be had here. And I do think it involves some exemptions around affordable housing. So I don't want actions that we create today around um, moving the restrictions of the affordable pool, removing them completely, eliminating um, us to continue having this discussion because there's a lot of things that are undefined and left to be interpreted differently in this. And I would still feel very strongly at the very least that our housing authority is exempted from this. It's our housing authority. I'm not sure why they have to jump through the hoops that we've created in this. And so I appreciated Councillor Frake's suggestion that we bring them here. I'd like to hear from them directly as opposed to um, others who have suggested what they've heard over the years. And so I think that's an important point. Okay, thank you. Ms. Stewart? Yeah, I, I would echo, you know, I'm obvious, I'm super willing to compromise. That is, that's fine with me. I. <laughs> I have concerns around just simply extending the affordable pool because that still keeps in place like a lot of restrictions and red tape um, that I think is is burdensome because we still then can't necessarily um, – I mean, I know there's consensus for front loading. So I think that that is really important um, to front load the banking and to make sure that that is approved. And sometimes those require hearings as well. And so my concern with just extending the affordable pool is that it doesn't actually solve the full problem. And we still have to make sure that um, you know, our housing authority or another affordable housing developer is able to get the allocations that they need up front so that they can get the CHAFA funding. Um, and so I guess my concern is that this would be, while I'm, I'm comfortable as long as we can get there in this conversation, my concern is that this would be much more piecemeal to just extend the pool and not expire it because then we also need to write in potential front loading on the banking process. And do we still need a 40 unit review hearing in front of council? Because you're never guaranteed, I'm experiencing this right now, you're never guaranteed that something that comes in front of council is going to pass. That's just the reality of it. And I don't want to, create that burden on our affordable housing developers like our housing authority. So simply just extending f the affordable pool and even rolling it over, I think doesn't actually solve all of the red tape and the process issues that are involved in, you know, potentially some barriers that we're seeing. So I guess that that would be my concern. That was why I suggested the exemption, because I don't think it's just about the allocations. I think it's about 
when you can get them and how long it takes to get them and whether or not you're guaranteed that your project is going to be um, approved by the council. And all of these things remove guarantees in the process. And there is no um, nobody who builds affordable housing who can go through with projects like this that de that depend on LIHTC funds and things like that without guarantees. So I guess those are those are my concerns. Okay, thank you. Mr. Abel. I would like to remind uh, folks that the 40 units or more depends on a majority vote on council. And if someone has a problem that they don't want majority votes on council to uh, call the shots, I don't know where we go. That's what our job is. Um, you know, if, if I, I don't think that we're going to have that kind of resistance on a lot of these things, especially uh, regarding affordable housing. But my goodness, if we're worried that there has been only one project that I know of that council has rejected, and that was uh, 533 Van Gordon. Uh, so I, I am not sure where that's going, but I certainly think that if somebody comes to us with a project and the majority of city council thinks it's not worthy, um, then that should be our call. That's why we were elected. Thank you. Ms. Vincent. I'm gonna see if maybe I can start landing the plane a little bit. <laughs> what I'm hearing is that um, we there's an agreement that we can go ahead and move the allocation so they don't expire in May out till December. But then I hear there's also a great concern that we don't let this fall through the cracks and we have to address some, some additional items on this and that maybe we won't get to it. Is it possible, um, I guess, to ask Ms. Hudson if there is a time when maybe we can schedule another, um, another meeting to talk about these additional items that, that seem to keep coming up? Mayor, can I answer that? Yes, please. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, you know, this really, has been your first conversation around the SGI. And um, so I was gonna I was gonna suggest about the same thing. And that is we kind of look at this kind of two different ways, one in the, the short term and one in the longer term. So the short term would be this extension of the allocation so that the immediate need can be um, can be addressed right now. What we would do then is um, put together a study session that's pretty holistic. I, um, I'm hearing it'd be helpful to have somebody from Metro West Housing um, come and speak to the group, potentially someone from Chaffa as well. Um, uh, Councilor Jansen asked about Boulder and we had a question about Golden as well. We could bring that information to or, and just to kind of refresh people's um, understanding of these, the way other communities handle this. There was also a question about what kind of burden um, does this kind of development create for city services as it relates to Denver water and those other kinds of provisions. So we would do our very best to host uh, either a study session or a couple of study sessions to allow for um, a good community conversation with uh, all of these stakeholders, if you will, or these, um, um, yeah, stakeholders, I guess, to um, have a question and answer with you. The other advantage of this is, again, this is kind of the first notice out to the public, and it gives ample time for you to, between now and when we're able to have this meeting for you to really socialize this with your communities, whether that's in newsletters or ward meetings or whatever that might be. So that that's my suggestion. And, you know, where are we? We're April, April 18th. I'm confident we can get a study session put together in the next couple of months. It'll be a little bit of a 
a coordinating uh, effort, but I think we can do that. And then from there, you can direct staff in terms of any um, potential modifications or further modifications that you would want to make to the 1427 ordinance, to the law that was approved by the voters. Does that sound sufficient? I got two thumbs up out of that. That's not horrible. I just got a third. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Maya Guerrero. I just have a, a point of clarification of this like first part about affordable housing allocations and what you were just saying, Ms. Hodgson. So, I mean, are, are we able to like move forward on both of these ideas and then, you know, we can be doing our stakeholding and learning until we end up with second reading on either of them, right? Or like, what is it not possible to bring both of these ideas at the same time, recognizing that they are both independent from the like rest of the conversation about the SGI, right? Like, but both basically like solutions to the affordable housing approach. So, so go, ahead. go ahead, Mayor. Well, I, I, just for clarity. So we certainly, we have the front loading going forward as I have a consensus on that. We have a uh, uh, extension of the credits till the end of the year. Um, that there's a consensus on that. So I guess, I, am I missing something? Yeah, it just, to, to me, I mean, I guess I want clarification that this means that the idea of exempting affordable housing from the allocation process is basically being like pulled off the table, at least in terms of it being its own discrete policy rather than as a component of this larger conversation around SGI. If that's a question to me, if, if there's consensus on council um, to completely exempt affordable housing from the SGI, then we can do that, just direct staff to do that. I'm not sure we had council consensus on that. So maybe I didn't quite catch that, but it didn't feel like we had full consensus and that um, various council members wanted um, to study different things and had various questions. Okay, so. thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hodgson. That was very helpful. Of course. All right, Ms. Franks, then Ms. Jensen. Yeah, and I just wanted to build up that. I think that's where many of us landed is there's just the definitions that need to be solidified. There's metrics that need to be brought to bear. So I think that it is only off the table at this point because there's too many unknowns to make that blanket, blanket statement and then not really understand where those dividing lines are. So I certainly think it's a part of the discussion. And certainly I know you guys will continue to advocate. But once we have those data points, then we can start talking about the realities. Well, what does that mean? Where is that AMI point? What does that mean for our community? Who's that going to involve? So at this point, yeah, again, I think that that's why we're not building that consensus at this point. Okay. And Ms. Jensen, please. Yes, and I, I'm on that page too with Barb. Um, I totally agree with her. Um, I just don't think we should have exemptions right now. Um, but yes, um, moving moving forward and um, and doing those allocations, like we said, I think that's the best way to go. Um, but everything Barb said was exactly how I feel. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So we have clarity around those. So this, you know, this is good learning for all of us. So we, those can go forward, right? There's consensus to ask staff to draft those. Now this will go through our first and second reading. And we've had this happen in the past. If there's a motion or, or, or council wants to go a different direction on second reading, that can be done within certain limitations. So I know, you know, while we didn't have full consensus on everything, we do have enough for this to be written in that matter, but on second reading, you can certainly amend it however you see fit. Any other questions in regard to that? All right, do, do we need any Clarification, uh, Mr. Parker, you kind of got us summarized. <laughs> I, I think so. And I can always go back and look at this. It, yeah, it looks like we're talking about yeah, front loading and extending through the end of the year, providing those those two for now. 
Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, nicely done, folks. Um, and then we'll work on kind of this all-inclusive type um, study session with our key providers. And, and you know, and, and it might be also prime, Ms. Hudson, because we'll have a better idea of these five affordable housing bills that might also shape a little bit more of the discussion. And then I think there's also some other bills that might pertain to zoning and codes for affordable housing that will be prime for the discussion also. All right, Ms. Strom, your hands up. Yeah, just a quick question. I was confused on the purpose of the memo that we received with regards to the upcoming workshop for August 16th. This was last year. Those, when I went back at looking at council agendas, I don't see that these ever got resolved. Is this something that we'll be doing at some point as well? Or why did we get this? Was there something else that we needed to get out of that second document for tonight? So that second document was just the last discussion that the previous council had had about potential changes to 1427. So that's why that was sent because that, that was the latest information that staff had about, you know, the direction council was looking. And that, and that, those still may, may be very relevant. And, and that's, again, that's this whole broader piece that council will be able to, I think, better tackle at a, a study session and maybe have that bucket as a piece of it as well. So buckle up and be ready for a long night whenever that one gets scheduled. And um, we'll, we'll have a great conversation. We cool on this one? Okay. Move into item five, discussion code of ethics for local government officials. Um, there was no presentation on Lakewood Speaks. There was one comment, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Hodson. Yeah, thank you. So for this final topic, um, your city attorney, Allison McKinney-Brown, will just kind of frame it up. And again, um, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion around a potential ethics code. So Allison. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. McKinney-Brown. Good evening. Um, my camera's at an odd angle, so it looks like I'm looking up at the ceiling. I'm not exactly sure how to fix that. Oh, there we go. It switched what me to my other see? camera. What do you switched. see when you look up? Um, so um, tonight, the city council will take the second step toward adoption of a local code of ethics for elected officials and their appointees. The first step was to direct me to develop this first draft of the ethics code. This matter comes before you as a result of a 2006 amendment to the Colorado Constitution. In that year, the Constitution was amended to require that public officials of the state be required to conform to certain ethical standards. That law was made specifically applicable to local government officials. Important to tonight's agenda item, Section 7 of Colorado Constitution Article um, 20, 29, I think it is, XXIX, provides language that allows home rule municipalities to exempt themselves from the provisions of that constitutional provision. If the home rule municipality should adopt local rules that address the matters covered by that article. From 2006 through most of 220, that constitutional language was interpreted to allow home rule cities to adopt any provision such city deemed appropriate for their city. The only requirement was that the code be formally adopted. In October 2020, the provisions of Section 7 were reviewed and interpreted by the Colorado Court of Appeals. Following that decision, the Independent Ethics Commission, the body charged with applying the law of the Constitution, Ethics and Government, officially determined that they would only accept as valid exemptions to the Constitution and state ethics codes Ethics codes adopted by home rule cities that include four specific elements. The four mandatory elements are a gift ban, a complaint and investigative process, a penalty provision or discipline process, 
and an independent decision maker. Because the city of Lakewood has not passed an ordinance adopting the local code of ethics for local government officials to exempt out from the state constitutional provisions, it, the city of Lakewood remains subject to the Colorado constitution. Tonight, staff is providing the city council with a proposed draft code of ethics that is intended to conform to the most recent interpretations of the requirements of section seven. The goal of tonight's discussion is for the members of the city council to discuss amongst themselves the various provisions included within this first draft of ethics and to decide if there are specific provisions they would like to remove or would like to add. On that note, I need to tell you that this is the third city in which I've been tasked with developing a draft ethics code. And those prior, those prior experiences have shown me that I should not become the focus of this discussion by attempting to answer hypotheticals or personal issues off the cuff, because those types of questions are very fact dependent and require some research and thought. My job tonight is to listen and take notes and let the 11 members of the city council work together to take the next steps to craft a document which will serve to strengthen their relationship with the community they serve. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to the mayor and go on silent so I can listen carefully to your discussion. Great, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you uh, putting this forward. And um, council over the last few years, we've brought to light our policies and procedures and uh, harassment code. And then I think for some time, this has been the last piece uh, moving forward. So with that, I'll go to Mr. Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. McKinney Brown, are you available for factual information? For instance, the uh, Cersa's uh, handbook uh, on ethics, liability, and best practices says that the district attorney is the um, the person who decides the cases. That the district attorney uh, that ethics violations are presented to the district attorney. Is that correct? And if so, can we change that? That's correct right at this moment. Um, for, me, for many of the ethics violations. So at this point, this, this city council uh, is under the control of the Independent Ethics Commission. And there are also elements where violations by elected officials may be reviewed by the district attorney. But the primary place at this point under, to the, under the constitutional amendment is the IEC, the Independent Ethics Commission. Uh, okay, that's, well. Uh, Secondly, and I, I, I like the way this is put together and it explains a lot of things that people have been speculating about that are just absolutely uh, not the fact. I would like, however, to see a financial disclosure component added to this. If in private uh, industry, uh, the corporate world, uh, such disclosures are uh, widespread and very demanding. Uh, and it is to uh, for the protection not only of the corporation itself, but um, the folks, clients, and others that they may deal with. I think that it is very important that folks in the public sector be as transparent in their financial dealings as possible. The Colorado revised statutes require or, or accept voluntary disclosures from municipal uh, elected officials. Uh, they say we may disclose. Uh, however, 
the state representatives, state senators, the governor, the attorney general, judges, district attorneys, the PUC members, public utility commission members, and the RTD board members are required to file financial disclosure. Now, I don't think we need to know how many dollars you get from each source of revenue that one might have. And it is largely an honor kind of system in that how are we going to know if you're not disclosing everything? But I think it's a good faith gesture, and I think it might raise the public's confidence for us uh, to know the sources of our revenue. Mine, for instance, would be two Scripps Howard pension plans, Social Security, and my majestic pay from the city of Lakewood. Uh, we don't need actual numbers. I think we do. We would need to know if you're invested uh, in stocks. Now, if you're in a, uh, a money market plan or something similar, a 401k, and you don't know what stocks are there, it's just a fund, uh, then that's, that's good enough. Just note that you have a 401k administered by Vanguard or Wells Fargo or whomever. Uh, but I think it's very important that our uh, sources of income be disclosed. Uh, there might be some surprises from some of us. It might go against the grain of what we present as our public persona. But I think it is very important that we know or that we disclose all of our sources of income. Uh, and if you have any, I know you don't want to give us advice, Ms. McKinney Brown, but you are, you generally have pretty good advice for us. So either tonight or in the process of this whole ethics thing, I'd like to see some sort of uh, advice on what the ideal uh, disclosure would entail. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Maya Guerrero. Yeah. Um, you know that this, you know, conversation as you, you know, alluded to in your in your uh, opening here, um, Ms. McKinney Brown was around. <coughs> you know that this is not maybe the first conversation around this, so I recognize that I may not have a hundred percent of the like detailed context. So my questions are a little bit more basic than Council Abel's. Um, and I know that we're trying to move towards discussion, but I promise I'm not doing a like, here's the situation, what's the deal? Um, I was wondering if you could just like let us know, is this sort of structured similarly to other towns, right? You said you've worked on several of them to the state. Um, and in particular, one of my sort of main questions is really around um, the way that the, the gift section is written, um, it like seems to be specifically enumerating what gifts are allowed rather than what gifts aren't allowed. And is that like the industry standard? Because I, that, I, found, I found that approach very surprising, but I've not read many codes of ethics, I will admit. The answer to your question is uh, the gift provision that we have incorporated into this code of ethics is very common, is, is very common among the rest of the cities in Colorado. Honestly, I, off the top of my head, I've been, I've been working uh, or monitoring about 20 of these codes of ethics. And uh, off the top of my head, most of them either say, state the, um, you are not allowed to accept gifts over X amount of money, but the following don't count as gifts, or they just say you may not count, accept anything over X amount of money. The difference here is under the new uh, decision of the IEC, the IEC said it's not gonna get involved in whether or not these codes of ethics are more or less restrictive than the state. 
they're only getting involved in whether or not they cover the mandatory elements. So the gift provision at the state level, I think is $53 right now, and it goes up the dollar a year or something. So right now, if you were to accept a gift of more than $53, there are a list of four or five exemptions of what is not a gift in the state statute. Um, and what, what the team and I did was we changed that number to 100, I believe. And the reason is, instead of trying to go up incrementally every year, instead of trying to figure out what is the exact value, it just seemed like having a nice round number would made more sense. If this now that's another area for discussion. If the city council wants to choose another kind of number, it really is your call. We were just setting out what we thought would be an easy number for everybody to remember. So you don't have to remember, I think it's 5375 right at the moment um, for the state. So anyway, uh, the only real difference between the gift provisions that we've incorporated and the state gift provisions is that number. Thank you. I really appreciate all of that um, context. And then I'll I'll just say, and this is not really a specific question, or maybe it is if, there, if there's a specific answer. Um, but to me, like, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not poured over many ethics um, policies. But when I was reading this, I was sort of like ending up kind of reading this list of like, okay, this one's allowed, and this one's allowed, and this one's allowed. And I'm like, you know, Surely a friend of mine is allowed to buy me a plane ticket, but like that's like has nothing to do with anything to do with the city. And I don't know, just the way I was reading it as enumerated felt like there wasn't that. I don't know. I'd be curious as to what other people thought when they were reading this. All right, Mr. Olber. Thank you. Um, I like Charlie's idea um, about financial disclosures. Uh, being added, but uh, you know the devil's in the details most times, and so I'd be very interested in seeing the language that we would do to, to you know, we would we could add um, to do something like that. Uh, I'm very secretive, but I'm also retired, and so like I have nothing to worry. You know, you can look at everything I've got, but at the same time, I'm really secretive. Uh, even today, Walgreens called me and, and wanted to, con you know, they called me and wanted to confirm my address and I was just, no. <laughs> and so I, I would like this, I'd, I'd like to go along with them and just and to see what we would come up with. Now, as for reading over it itself, I, I have one little suggestion to make a change. It was under section 2.03.040. Uh, B as in boy. It just says there, it says each council member present shall vote on all ordinances, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't love the word shall. I, I would rather it change to can because right now, the way it's written, if we decide that there's something we don't want to vote on and besides conflict of interest, um, then we're in ethics violation. So, you know, I, I I don't have an example, but I can imagine that at some point I'm gonna there's going to be something before us, and I just go, yeah, I'm not going to vote on that, and so I don't want to be forced. So that's the only change I'd like to see. I should probably respond to that in that that language is right out of charter. Yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> Oh, that pesky charter constitution. I know, I know. Let's change it. Oh, my God. Let's exempt the charter. <laughs> All right, I get it. I know what you're saying there. I, I assumed something like that, but I still don't like it being an ethics violation at all. And I think you can understand why. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Springsteen. So a lot of you are new on council and I really wanna to talk to you sincerely 
about the history of where this is coming from and um, why I feel it's being put forth at this point in time. Now, keep in mind, I'm an attorney. I am bound by a set of ethics already every day in my life. Um, but what has occurred over the, the last year or two has been essentially a witch hunt uh, over any time that somebody uh, disagrees with the status quo on this council and is a little too outspoken about it and maybe a little controversial and um, is trying to go about things in, in maybe a different manner uh, uh, because they can't be accomplished in a different way. And so part, part of what that has resulted in, um, and I, I don't know why this is not of more concern to y'all, but I received a death threat a couple weeks ago, they said, whoever it was that sent it, spoofing the mayor's email or whatever, that if I don't resign, I am going to be killed. My car is going to be blown up. They're going to send someone to rape me. Well, also my house was broken into and flooded. I have $100,000 worth of damage. I haven't had a kitchen since the National League of Cities conference. And I know you're asking yourselves, why is that related to this? Because it is related to what this is about. This is about a witch hunt. This is about, and it's not just about me. It's about me and whoever serves on council after me who, um, you know, Essentially, there's always going to be a majority rule on council. And what I'm reading from this is that if the majority of council decides to vote that they just don't like somebody and they're going to censure them and they're going to punish them, they can do that anytime they want. And... Um, you know, there was this long section about the complaint section and IEOs and the hearing process. So now, if we're going to serve on counsel, we have to be able to afford legal counsel in order to defend ourselves on these um, attempts at censure and witch hunts. I mean, because that's what I've been through over the last couple of years. I've had to retain counsel multiple times. Is that what you all want to have to do? And I, I'm, I'll try to, to break it down to something that you might relate to. So for example, Counselor Stewart, when she was talking about affordable housing tonight, was talking about how hard it is for her and a lot of people like her, uh, and the 80% of AMI situation, that's, that's a very reasonable concern. Does that mean that you are gonna have a conflict of interest under, under this document to be able to vote on affordable housing issues because it personally affects you? That, that doesn't, I mean, at what point do we draw the line in the sand? This is overly broad. This is pu uh, punitive. Ms. McKinney Brown should not have been the one to write this because she has a conflict of interest in what she and I have gone back and forth with on, on, um, these, these attempts at the witch hunt. So for instance, she was directly involved in writing a letter 
along with the mayor about me to the Independent Ethics Commission for the state in, on November 1st. And you all weren't on council yet, but um, what happened was the IEC responded within two hours and rejected that letter and said that they didn't have jurisdiction, even though Ms. McKinney Brown is, is seeing, seeming to rewrite state law here. They said um, that we are a home rule municipality and I will, I will um, refer to um, the fact that um, the, the state constitution provides that jurisdiction of the IEC does not extend to home rule cities like Lakewood who have adopted rules that address similar ethics matters. So for instance, Lakewood already has a code of conduct that generally covers um, matters like conduct towards the public and other council members, professionalism, civility, respect, decorum, and values and instructs how to make inquiries, prepare for meetings, be familiar with laws and so on and so forth. We already had this in place. And that is why the IEC did not get involved in that. And um, so I, I guess, you know, <laughs> part of the question is why is this coming up now? And for those of you who weren't on council, you didn't see some of the history of this, but um, so in the mayor's letter to the IEC, what he was asking was whether I could vote on anything to do with the budget for the city or anything to do with police department matters. And so, <laughs> then breaking out why I shouldn't vote on the budget. Um, and by the way, what, what was claimed was the conflict of interest was that I assisted in getting a civil rights lawsuit started for somebody close to me who was injured by the police. I was not permanent counsel of record. I did not get pecuniary gain out of that. Um, that person does not even live with me most of the time. However, um, this was found to be some kind of conflict of interest. And I still fail to know how, because it, what it really did was to assist our city in um, doing away with some excessive force practices. And the other, the other case that was cited was a pro bono case I took for a black man who said excessive force was used on him. That was not a civil lawsuit. That was criminal defense work. And I took it pro bono. So in both cases, should not have been an issue. I was not benefiting. If anything, I wish to hell I had nothing to do with either of those cases because it has brought me nothing but grief. And I didn't deserve that. I was trying to make good changes in how we do things in the city and reduce our liability. But what the, what the mayor said is that I shouldn't vote on anything regarding the budget because um, the budget includes appropriations to one, the city attorney's office, which pays to defend against the council members lawsuits Two, the police department, which employs most of the individuals defendants named in the litigation. Three, risk management, which holds all funds in the settlement agreements Four, any other departments. I mean, seriously, so, so I'm not allowed to vote on anything regarding the budget. Obviously, I should recuse myself if it has anything to do with these two cases that I'm involved with. But 
to completely disenfranchise my voters who voted for me and take away my voting powers completely? Is that reasonable? But this, this is what we're contemplating with this document, I promise you. And so um, the handbook that CERSA puts out is very specific about what um, local ethical regulations should entail. It says, if drafted with appropriate attention to specificity, effective local regulation will put public officials on notice of precisely what constitutes inappropriate behavior related to their public service and will clearly inform constituents of what is expected of their local representatives. Uh, regulation should be well-defined steps for disclosure and recusal in circumstances giving rise to conflicts of interest. Local code should include terms and phrases designed to avoid vagueness and ambiguity. Well, I heard right off the bat, um, Councillor Mayant Guerrero is already questioning the vagueness and ambiguity. And um, so, you know, I really think what this is about is to further silence and, um, and to put a chilling effect on anybody who might want to have independent ideas or independent votes on especially controversial issues. And so I, I really challenge you all, given the extent to, to which this has escalated now, these kinds of witch hunts, which, you know, I mean, frankly, city leadership doesn't give a damn but I give a damn as a single mother that I have to feel unsafe in my house and that I had a death threat and that stuff like this escalated it to that level. And so I, I really ask you to really think this through carefully. And even if you don't care about how it affects me, if you think I'm too controversial or whatever it is, think about future counselors. Think about yourselves. Um, you know, I mean, it's interesting that we have multiple situations of um, potential conflict of interest that that go un acknowledged all the time. We have, you know, the mayor using looking at Lakewood to campaign against his own citizens, soliciting the attorney who sued his own citizens in an initiative. And yet he votes on the SGI and whether it should go to appeal and things like that. Um, you know, would this have prevented uh, the mayor from essentially offering one of the co-petitioners money to stop the initiative. Would this, would this create uh, a place where there could be a complaint about that? Would this create a, a place where there would be a complaint about, um, and I brought this up before, I, I was presented with a letter two hours before we were interviewing the city attorneys, the new city attorneys saying that I could be prosecuted if I participated in that meeting. And um, the letter was presented by Holland Evans, who Ms. McKenney Brown knows very well and works with. And they wanted their person to make it into office and they got it. And guess who she hired? on the civil rights case right off the bat that they're complaining about me participating in. She hired Hall and Evans. Isn't that something? Isn't that a conflict of interest? This, should, this really needs to be thought out. And I, I, I'm really trying to, to be calm and, um, and appeal to your humanity on this. 
because you have no idea what it's like to be a single mother and be threatened the way I have and have my house upside down the way it is. And this is just feeding those flames. It really, really is. Thanks. All right, Ms. Strom. Thank you. I have uh, a couple of questions uh, regarding um, what Councilor Springsteen mentioned and also a couple of other questions that came up earlier. Um, first, I'm curious, is, is there a definitive difference between what a code of conduct is and what a code of ethics is? So what's the difference between the two? What are we adding with the code of ethics that's not already part of the code of conduct and full transparency? I haven't um, looked at the details of the code of conduct. Um, so I'd like a little more information about that. Separately, as far as you know, the mention of council being able to um, basically expel the vote of a member, um, could we potentially in 20, or I'm sorry, 2.03.080, or I'm sorry, 070, change letter C, change it so that there could be an appeal by that third party independent investigator selected by the IEO, if, if that's how I'm reading that correctly on the next page, could that be something that we, we change that so that there is the opportunity at least for an appeal? So those are those two. Um, separately, I'm curious about the mention um, earlier, Councilor Over and financial disclosures. Is that fairly common with municipal elected? And then separately, um, Looking at 2.03.080, number one, A, people are afraid to speak, and um, you know, there are you know situations that you see. I mean, we we hear about Councilor Springsteen mentioning her own. Um, is having an address included something that's an absolute requirement? Because I do think that that is something that can create some hesitancy for people actually complaining or um, prompting an investigation about an ethical violation. That's my list of questions. Thank you. Ms. McKinney Brown, do you want to? Yeah, I'm sorry. It was taking me a while to get my cursor to go to the unmute. That was a long list of questions. I hope I don't miss any. If I do, just, just let me know. Yes, an ethics code and a code of conduct are very different. And uh, the, the, the code of conduct that was created by the city council includes how meetings should be run and um, just how boards and commissions are selected, just generally the business of being city council. A code of ethics is defined by the state constitution. So, and I'm sorry, I'm working from two screens. Let me see if I can get my cursor back up there. So the gift ban provisions are not found in the code of ethics or in the code of conduct. You, in order to have a code of ethics, that would allow this city as a home rule city to be out from underneath the constitutional provisions, they have to adopt a gift ban that has to be included. Whether or not cities are including uh, statements of financial disclosure, that typically is something that's common at the state level and not common at the local level. But again, this is your document. I gave you a first draft and you as a body get to decide what works well for Lakewood. Um, as far as 2.03080 filing complaints, one of the concerns that you as a body are going to have to address is balancing people wanting to file anonymous complaints or having people outside the city file uh, complaints. Um, and you won't know that or you won't be able to verify if these things are true. Um, we 
we've all been watching social media across the country and people say all sorts of awful, awful things on social media because they're hidden and they can get away with that. So one of the concerns is the new IEC ruling says that there must be a complaint and investigative process. So the complaint would have to be verified exactly what verification details the city council wants. You as a body get to decide. And if you want to allow somebody from Arizona who's outside of the city to file complaints, then that is your choice. If what you really want to focus on is what's happening with the citizens, you're probably going to need to know their address to know that they're located within the city. Um, but again, this is a first draft and it is a document that you as a body get to decide what you want, you want it to look like. Um, as far as the, the language about the complaint and investigative process, I'm going to tell you that this is a brand new requirement. And it just came out of the IEC late in 2021. So we've only actually been looking at it a few months. Only two cities that I'm aware of have actually addressed it, which means all the rest of the home rule cities are in conflict with the IEC right at the moment. The two that have addressed it are Centennial and Denver. And what Centennial and Denver did is they created ethics commissions and uh, appointed people to ethics commissions. But remember, the process has to be the whoever makes the decision, has this person violated the ethics code or have they not, has to be independent from the body. So most cities allow the city council, or originally wrote their ethics codes, to allow the city council to be the final decision maker. But the IEC said, no, it has to be an independent body. And so instead of going with a, a large commission idea like Denver and Centennial did, we uh, opted to present an idea of an independent hearing officer and exactly to address some of the concerns that Councilmember Springsteen was stating that some people might feel that they need to get an attorney to represent themselves. And we were trying to make it as user friendly because if the city council member thinks they have to get an attorney every time a complaint is filed against them, that means the complainant has to get an attorney because this isn't the city. This is a citizen filing the complaint against the city council member. So the city doesn't play a role. It won't be my office representing either the complainant or the city council member. So we didn't want to set it up that there was this requirement in order to file a complaint, you had to go hire an attorney. In order to defend a complaint, you had to go hire an attorney. So if you read this uh, carefully, you would have seen that it's set up so um, it would be reviewed and both parties would get to make statements to this individual hearing officer who could, who could just weigh what each side said. So that was, our, that was our attempt to make this much more user-friendly and try to take some of the ugliness out of just people having questions. So I think that answers your questions, Council Member. Did I miss any? There was just the one on the appeal. So for 2.03.070, letter C, If the city council you, wants, you, yeah, the city. If the city council wants to add another layer to the review process and add an appeal in, you absolutely can do that. Um, one of the things I should clarify is that the city council already has the means to remove members from the city council, and this is the most interesting thing I've ever seen. Uh, is something I haven't seen in other cities' charters, but this city charter specifically provides that the city council shall, by ordinance, establish what actions a city council member might take that are so egregious to the city council that the city council can vote to remove that person from the city council. So um, 
I already included reference to that within the ethics code. But I think that this ethics code isn't supposed to be pushing that far. I mean, the reality is if someone has acted to that degree, they're outside the ethics code and they're into the just uh, violation um, that requires removal. The, um, the ethics code as written is intended to allow the city council to review actions, to review concerns by citizens and allow public censure. And by the way, anybody who's been tracking the law in the last two weeks has seen that the, uh, uh, you know, the Colorado Supreme Court just made a ruling on the ability to censure members of city councils with or without an ethics code. So the ethics code doesn't create that right, but I think it really does uh, guide city council to use that in the most appropriate way and with some level of due process in there. So those are my best ideas. But remember, this would be your document. And if there's something that you'd like to see, speak up and, and I'll make notes about that. Thank you. Ms. Franks. This question is for Ms. McKinney Brown. I wanted to understand um, if the ability to uh, report anonymously, which I was just here reading what Denver has put together and they've got, you know, quite a few caveats and different things that have to happen. I wanted to understand the difference and, I, and I'm not trying to make a, a direct comparison, but I know like if we have uh, someone who um, is uh, maybe wanting to make a complaint about barking dogs and we don't allow that to be anonymous, even though maybe those folks believe that there could be some retaliation in that, is that that because that process actually goes through a standard judicial process versus a um, investigatory body. I'm just trying to understand the differences because each one of those folks could have similar concerns about retaliation or those types of things. So can you help put a little bit of foundation around that? Our code is a code of law. So every time the city council passes a code and it goes into the code book, it's a code of law. Unless specifically the criminal provisions are exempted out of the code, the criminal provisions apply. And you'll notice this code of ethics specifically exempts out those criminal provisions. It makes it very clear those do not apply to ethics. Ethics is not about criminal acts. If it's a criminal act, then it needs to be turned over to the district attorney, as Council Member Abel said. This is just about ethical standards. Um, so when someone wants to file a complaint about a barking dog, they're actually filing a criminal complaint. And we'll call it a nuisance complaint, or we can call it a code complaint, but the reality is it's a criminal complaint. And when they file that, they they have to be public. You cannot secretively file charges against another party. So that's why they are not allowed to file that, that information anonymously. There are times, of course, when they'll call code enforcement and say, hey, can you come out and witness this bad act so you can be the witness and you can be the complainant and not me. And of course, we really try to accommodate that to the best of our ability, but in the end, a victim slash witness cannot be private under the United States Constitution. You get to be able to confront your accuser. In the ethics code, this is not criminal. It very specifically says it is not criminal and that the section of the criminal code does not apply to these provisions. But the idea that one member of council might just be peppered nonstop by anonymous complaints. Um, I think council member Springsteen said earlier, someone went out and created a fake email address, attached the mayor's name to it, and then sent her a horrible email. That's spoofing emails is not that difficult. And all of you who went to CML two years ago we had an entire two hour lesson on how easy it is to spoof emails. So the thing is, is those kind of awful things do happen. And it would be, it, the way we drafted this code was an attempt to not allow the ethics code to be used as a tool for those kind of, of just ugly attacks, baseless, ugly attacks. 
Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, again, I thought I was on the right track in separating those two out, but I just thought it was a good uh, thing to get some good clarity around. So thank you. Mr. Olber. Thank you. Um, right now, since we haven't passed this, we are we are covered by the uh, Colorado Constitution, Article yes. 29. And so I'm wondering if maybe it would be nice to get a um, a difference between what what that says we have to do or you know and what we're proposing here um a red line or something like that i i noticed i picked up on that like the article 29 is saying uh, 50 dollars which is then increments by the cost of living oh my god but uh and, I, and we're at a hundred dollars so we, yeah but uh you know, I'm just thinking maybe that's something we could look at. There isn't any way to do a red line comparison. I, I can't send you a red line comparison. I can send you a copy of the Constitution and the attached statutes. And I can send you, uh, you have, you've already got a copy of this draft, but they don't compare up to be a red line type of version. Um, the other thing you should be aware of is while the IEC has the ability to give um, let to give advice pursuant to the Constitution. They're in experience. They're hesitant to do that. So, in order to in order for anyone to use the IEC, they have to make an they have to make an actual complaint to the IEC, and that's such a that's such a, a step, and nobody wants to do that. Um, so. One of the things about having a, the major difference between having the draft ethics code adopted and having your own local code and being under the state code is whether or not you have any local control. That's really the difference. And if, if it's through, if somebody has a concern about one of you today, they can file a, a complaint to the IEC and the IEC will review to make sure that we have no home rule ethics code adopted. And once they make that determination, then they would uh, be able to uh, prosecute this at their level. And, it, and that does require hiring attorneys. That, that's a pretty high level action. Ms. Jansen. Thank you. Um, so I'm in favor of an amendment to allow the appeal process, because in light of the citizen independent review committee being an option, I think it's better because it provides safeguards for the single whistleblower. Okay, thank you, Mr. Abel. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> The idea of censure reappears in this uh, ethics uh, proposal. I just wanted to add some background there that a few years ago, uh, City Council removed censure from our policies and procedures manual. And at the time, censure required a majority to raise the issue and a supermajority for a finding to apply censure in any case. So at the very least, I mean, if, if this, this council wants to change our policies and procedures, that's certainly uh, in our purview. But I would uh, not like to see it revert back to where a simple majority could, uh, through political, uh, motivation, censor someone and uh, not have the super majority to uh, uh, requirement to make it a more stringent process. So um, I would think if we re return censure to the uh, and, and, and that was not part of an ethics thing. It was just a, uh, an entry in policies and procedures. So uh, does it belong in the ethics policy, firstly, 
And secondly, can we restore, uh, I would suggest that we restore the supermajority for uh, any finding of censure. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? All right. Um, so we've heard a little bit of feedback, uh, certainly about disclosure and appeal and um, <laughs> censure. You know, these, the, yeah. So, Ms. McKinney Brown, I'm not sure if we want to just kind of take these into consideration and and uh you know look at what some of these th different things would look like and we can add that to it and then speak to it at general business uh coming up sometime and then see if there's enough direction at general business to either move it forward or not i think that's a fine direction to go and i would uh, request that that those types of decisions be run through the city manager since she sets the agenda and she has a better idea of bringing things forward. But as far as incorporating, I've actually made a list of six different um, action items for potential review by the city council that I could incorporate into that. But as far as bringing it back, um, I certainly defer to the city manager. Okay. So yeah, go ahead, Ms. Hodgson. I mean, I, I think general business is controlled by council. So I think that if, if and when it's ready, we could just have it in there. I, Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mr. Abel. Um, I would like to see us come to a consensus tonight to go ahead with uh, consideration of this and bring it to us in a, uh, uh, ask staff to go ahead and prepare uh, an ordinance that would incorporate the things we've discussed tonight okay. instead of waiting months and then getting around to maybe putting it on the calendar and you know discussing it uh, i think we uh, ethics should be a priority for us there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about what about what certain definitions really mean and some mistaken uh, perceptions about uh, conflict and things like that. Um, you know, there is a lot of uh, uninformed thinking. So I think we need to go ahead and nail this down, get an ethics thing done. We, uh, in my first year on council six years ago, the mayor appointed a committee to do a code of conduct and review our ethics and suggest an ethics policy. Um, the code of conduct was uh, passed and uh, is in uh, policies and procedures, but then the mayor called us down from the task of uh, doing the ethics committee and it's kind of languished for the last six years. I'm not accusing the mayor of doing anything or, or any motive for that. That's just how the uh, record reflects this has occurred. So six years later, we're looking at, a, at the ethics policy, and I think we need to go ahead and give the nod to uh, the concept of establishing one and then uh, do the fine tuning on it. Good, Ms. Springsteen. You know, I, I just think there needs to be more discussion around what this needs to be, Councillor Abel, because um, certainly part of this witch hunt over the last year was about you. And you were one of the people who would be singled out by something like this. And all of us need to think about that and how we would be singled out and how it would be used politically against us. And, you know, I, I just pulled up the code of conduct that we have, and it includes many, many things that would need to be addressed, like harassment 
and, you know, treatment of the public and things like that. We already have those things in place. Maybe we want to fill that out a little bit, but, but this document is going to allow for people to be singled out and pushed off of council. And that, that is what's been happening to me for two years. And I don't want to see that happen to the rest of you. Thanks. So I, I would just say I, I need to see more uh, around some of the comments that were made. And I don't think this has to be tucked away for two or three months. I think Ms. McKinney Brown has a, a good grasp of some of the things to add in a red line that can just be simply discussed at general business and put forward. So that's how I feel. But if others feel different, please say so now. Okay. All right, so we will go forth with that and uh, note that we want to continue to move this forward in a timely fashion. I'm going to go to public input. Um, again, for those wishing to weigh in, there's a three minute time limit and um, you will hear the ding. And then um, when your time's up, you'll hear it again. And it looks like we have one hand up. Mr. Klaus, let me get your timer started. Hi, uh, John Klaus, Ward 1. Um, just calling in to say that uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Abel's um, first comment um, around financial disclosures. Um, that being said, I think it's also important to disclose um, not just where money is coming in from elected officials and commissioners in Lakewood, but also where their money is going out. So, for example, um, it seems worthwhile to know if elected officials are donating to dark money groups, 501c4, c5, c6s, that by law don't have to um, disclose their donors. Um, if we're going to be fully transparent around um, financial disclosures, it seems worthwhile knowing whether, you know, I'm in Ward 1, if one of my counselors uh you know is donating money to a dark money group that uh you know you know on one hand i may have a counselor saying they're um they're advocating for uh i don't know affordable housing or something like that all under the guise of you know getting people housed and then uh donating money to a group that's the complete antithesis of that so um yeah i just hope that that would uh, be taken into consideration that we're not just disclosing money coming in, but also uh, money going out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, I will go ahead and close that down and appreciate that. So we'll move into reports and committee reports, or if you have a ward meeting announcement that you wanna do, please feel free. Uh, Ms. Maya Guerrero. Uh, fabulous. So um, two announcements. Well, one committee report, one announcement. Just as a reminder that the word two board meeting is this Wednesday. It is both a Zoom link that you can find on the Lakewood City website um, and also a uh, in-person meeting at the Clement Center at the same time. My co-counselor, Councilman Vincent, will not be present. Um, and thank you so much for covering me last month. And I'm very happy to do an exchange, but I promise you all, she and I do talk. We really do about what we're hearing. So um, we'll we'll both we'll both find out what's on your mind that day. Um, and then just in the the briefest legislative re committee report to say that um, we did take another couple of um, favorable stances on bills. Uh, I think kind of the themes of the bills that we're seeing so far are on um, affordable housing and then sustainability seem to be the two things that are really rising to the attention of the legislative committee. And of course we have our next meeting um, this week. So looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, Councilor Shahrzai. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, just let folks know we do have a Ward 1 meeting um, this Thursday. It's virtual at 6 p.m. Um, we're going to be hearing from members of the CAT team as well as representatives from the county to share about some of the budget um, challenges that we face as a county in response to Tabor. And then I won't bore folks with a Dr. Cog update, but I'm happy to share that there is an opportunity for interested in connecting with other um, transportation, affordable housing um, wonks in the community. They are hosting their awards dinner next Wednesday. I believe that's the 27th. So it'll be at Empower Stadium. You'll have a chance to tour the field if you're interested. Thanks. Great, thank you. Councillor Stewart. Ward 3 also has a meeting this week. Um, it will be this Saturday at 9.30 at the Hyatt House, uh, one of the conference rooms at the Hyatt House in Belmar. We're going to be hearing from the new owners and management of Belmar. So come with your questions about what the vision is for economic revitalization. Um, I think it'll be a really great chance to have a dialogue and learn and meet some new people. So excited about that. And then go to Earth Day. All right. All right. No other committee reports or announcements. I will do one housekeeping update. So next Monday night is a uh, executive session and it is personnel matter. So it will be live in person in our room. Uh, where we hold executive sessions with the equipment. And then that will also carry over to Ms. Hodson's, which will be uh, in a couple weeks. So we have Ms. McKinney Brown's review. Her report was sent today. So you'll have that report and um, do some uh, work around that next Monday. And then in a few Mondays from now, we'll have Ms. Hodson's. All right. So, all right. I appreciate everybody. Have a wonderful evening.